Um, it's the only thing I Okay, I'm um, mic'd up. Good morning, everybody. Um, since this is a parallel session, we must be thinking that we're a small group of people and we're together. And so if we can move a little bit closer to the front, that'd be great. It's not going to fill up, is what I'm saying. <laughs> So, so just before we start the session, there's a few announcements. Today is quite a jam-packed day in terms of entertainment. So except for this really exciting session in the morning, there's also a cheese and wine over the poster session, which is between four and six. At six o'clock, there'll be a bus, there'll be all the game drive vehicles waiting out front here. You're gonna go straight for a game drive. And then from the game drive, it will take you to, to the golf club to have dinner. So you're going to be out for a lot of time, and it may get cold, so just make sure you're well packed. And that if you have to drive anywhere outside of the camp, if you're staying outside the camp, then leave your vehicles here in the parking area because that will prevent you having to walk around all over trying to fetch vehicles. Okay, so that's the announcements. Um, hopefully you've done your indemnity forms because if you decide to sort of stick yourself out of the game drive vehicle and touch the lions, we don't want to take any responsibility. So to start the session, we've got, uh, firstly, welcome to this morning's session on socio-ecological systems thinking and alternative approaches to protected area management and governance. I think this ties in very nicely to our first few talks, uh, well, for definitely the opening and the, and the first talk in terms of this meeting and its relevance and, and whether it's, it's really sort of serving a role in terms of the response side of protected area management. So to kick us off, I've got Alex Caron. Uh, Alex is going to be doing the, the plenary sort of talk on conserving savannas as complex socio-ecological systems in Southern Africa. Our TFCA is the solution. Thank you, Alex. Good morning, can you hear me? Yeah. So first, thank you, thank you uh, for the organizing uh, committee for giving me that uh, opportunity to talk in front of you today, and thank you for being here. So I uh, will talk to you today, uh, I mean, I will ask the question, are transfrontier conservation areas uh, the future of uh, African savannas? Um, and I will try to give a few in to answer that question. Um, I will giving, uh, I'm giving this talk on behalf of uh, a lot of colleagues from the research platform Production and Conservation in Partnership and the just handed uh, EU-funded project called ProSuli. And our our main message today is to say that we believe that the future of uh, African savanna lies beyond protected areas in a shared landscape in which uh, conservation objectives as well as local development and well-being objectives are achieved. And uh, we strongly believe as well that to achieve that, we, uh, we need more environmental justice in uh, TFCAs. So, um, the research platform Production and Conservation in Partnership started in 2007 and it's a collaborative group of 16 institutions from Zimbabwe, France, Botswana, Zambia, Mozambique and South Africa. And the main objective of the platform is to promote the coexistence between people and nature at the interface between protected areas and their periphery with a special emphasis on, on TFCAs. And we do that through uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. Um, supporting uh, young professionals, and we supported more than 150 postgraduate students in, in, in those 16 years, um, to work in TFCAs and, and uh, use their very interdisciplinary skills in those TFCAs. So, by the third day of, uh, of, that, of this conference, I will not talk to you more about uh, the Savannah biome, you know that a large proportion of Southern African uh, and Eastern Africa um, um, are uh, made of, of savannas or, or semi-arid grasslands or dry forest. And by now, you know as well all the dynamics 
uh, and the, the dynamic system that represents savannas with uh, many different types of, of uh, drivers, internal drivers such as uh, human uh, land transformation, herbivory, wild or domestic, uh, fire, natural or anthropogenic fires, and external drivers such as uh, climate change and uh, the rise, rising CO2 levels. If we look at the history uh, of or the origin of savannas, um, they uh, were uh, they emerged between 10 and 20 million years ago um, as a, a, um, a co-evolution, I would say, between C4 grasses, spiny trees, and African bovids. And clearly, they emerged a long time ago and without humans. But if you look at recent history and the, the last thousands of years, it's clear that uh, uh, pastoral societies have impacted and engineered uh, savannas uh, to a great extent. And the mechanisms uh, through which those savannas in Africa have been impacted are quite well known. The impact of uh, fire, of uh, livestock herding, and uh, uh, crawl fertilization of, um, of soil with moving households and so impacting heavily uh, distribution of nutrients within the, the ecosystem. So today, savannas uh, are clearly places where you have human uh, um, living in. And so it's important to understand that for the past hundreds and thousands of years, they have been there and they have, they have been interacting with those savannas and they belong to those savannas. And if we think about our, our main conservation paradigm, uh, we always have a reference point, oops, sorry, reference point in, 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 in mind because we always compare. We have more elephants than before. We have less rhinos than before. And so the, this reference point is often in matter of a century, 100 years, 150 years, but it's not at all 5,000 years or, or 10,000 years. So uh, our reference point in terms of savannas are savannas with people living in savannas. So what do we have today? We have two types of savannas. You have savannas outside protected areas and you have savannas inside protected areas. The large proportion of savannas are outside protected areas and they are heavily impacted by, by humans through land transformation. Um, they, are, uh, they will be experiencing a, a booming human population in the coming decades and those human population living in those savannas um, depend heavily on these semi-arid ecosystems for their livelihoods. What's happening in, in savanna inside protected areas, so uh, in national parks and other protected areas, you have very nice uh, mammal communities that are uh, uh, conserved, but there is probably one keystone species that is missing and is not conserved in the savanna. Those are humans, of course. And so with this point of view, you can it's a bit provocative, but asking the question, are national park natural enough to conserve savannas if you have removed one of the keystone species? And here, that refers to the status of savannas today with inside and outside protected areas, and it refers to the elephant in the room, which is colonialism, which basically, during colonialism, you have the, the imposition of the European worldview everywhere else. And within, during that process, the conservation paradigm emerged, uh, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And uh, it emerged within that European worldview, and so within the context of one form of definition of the relationship between people and nature. And that relationship is clearly a separation between people and nature. And so today we hear more and more about the decolonization of conservation, and it's clear that that unique, para that unique worldview that has been imposed uh, uh, onto, um, onto the, the world, basically, needs to be challenged. So, savannas uh, uh, extend largely beyond protected areas. They need humans to function in current context, even in protected areas. Huh? We've heard during the last two days how we can try to help park management to manage savannas. And we still have many human population, large population dependent on savannas. So if we want to conserve savannas, we need to take into account the, the different terms of the equation. Sorry. Yeah. 
Um, the first one is uh, the, the COP15 to protect 30% of, of the land by 2030. And uh, the second one is about the target 2.1, zero anger by 2030 of the Sustainable Development Goals in a context of doubling human population and therefore an increased demand for agricultural land. So if we keep on saying, on, on, on staying in the current land sparing approach, protected areas and non-protected areas, we have a huge competition for land that is coming. And it's, it's, quite an, it's not possible to solve that equation, basically. So why not thinking about more land sharing approach, about savannas, and trying to see how, yes, we can, we can change the way we do conservation, the way we do local development, and that would mean that savanna would be protected for, in a specific form, type, for biodiversity conservation, but at the same time for local development and well-being. And uh, 20 years ago in, in Southern Africa, there was a new initiative called TFCAs, Transfrontier Conservation Areas. And it's great because they were created to improve, at the same level, biodiversity conservation and local development and well-being. So across these large tracts of land, of protected areas, communal land, and other type of land uses, well, we, w we could do exactly what we need to, to, to conserve savannas. So that's amazing. However, if you look at the first 20 years of implementation of TFCAs, there is a range of issues that uh, we can point out. Um, the first one is uh, a, a relative imbalance between what has been invested towards conservation objectives versus what has been invested toward local development and well-being in favor of conservation, of course. And each time, most of the time that uh, local development and well-being has been considered, it has been through the angle, through the perspective of conservation community-based conservancy, anti-poaching activities, etc. The second issue is the recentralization of governance that we observe through, uh, in the TFCA process. Southern Africa in the late 80s, 90s has been pioneering in terms of devolving the uh, governance of natural resources to local stakeholders. It looks like if by 2000 it was said, ooh, that doesn't work, let's, let's push it away, and now we are going to recentralize uh, um, the governance in TFCAs around three dominant actors that are the state, conservation NGOs, and um, the uh, wildlife uh, economy private sector. And this is a big issue because this is uh, um, leaving on the side local stakeholders. Of course, they don't say that local stakeholders are part of the process, but they're not. If you go uh, in TFCA and ask people about their role in TFCA. Most of them don't even know that they are in a TFCA after 20 years. And secondly, they've never taken a decision for the management of TFCAs. And lastly, militarization of conservation. This is uh, something that is needed to respond to crises such as the rhino uh, poaching crisis. But if you overinvest in that component without, uh, to the detriment of other components such as supporting livelihoods or those kind of things, you can have short-term uh, uh, successes, like reducing the number of a rhino shot, but you compromise your mid-term and long-term objective in terms of coexistence between people and nature. So given that those observations, we, we strongly believe that TFCAs are on unsustainable pathways currently. And so this raises the question, how, do we, how can we conserve savannas in TFCAs in that context? So I will be uh, giving you three frameworks that we believe are extremely important to do that. The first one is environmental justice. Uh, environmental justice has been defined by Martin and colleagues in 2016 uh, as made of three components. The first one is distributional justice, the fact that you need to have an equal distribution of benefits. Usually this component is taken into account by, by uh, activities, projects that deal with uh, local communities. However, the business model around that is, is not really in favor of communities, of local stakeholders. Local stakeholders that provide their land, their, uh, their expertise, and take the, the major risk when they put that land in the, for a, a conservancy, for example. And we've seen that with the COVID-19 crisis. So the, big, the largest risk is not taken by the investors with money, 
but by the people, and they should be the, the, the ones who have the largest benefit. So this is necessary, but it's not sufficient. You also need to have procedural justice, so all, local, all stakeholders should be involved in the governance and decision making. And here we are completely failing. I mean, if, we, if you think about the creation of a corridor, uh, at a Savannah meeting you will have a nice student uh, doing some ecological modeling and, and, having, and saying that's where the corridor should be between two protected areas. Then a conservation NGO will, will negotiate with the state and try to have that uh, push forward and then the corridor will be gazetted and then finally people will go and, and inform the people that live in that very corridor that know they are living in a corridor. Okay, that's a caricature, but it often happens more closer to that caricature than the other way, not the proper way. Finally, the third component is about recognition, or recognition justice, and it's about respecting identities, cultures, and indigenous knowledge systems. And here I will come back to the European world vision that imposed its, uh, its uh, way of thinking about the relationship between people and nature. It was imposed on pre-existing worldviews, African worldviews, from dozens and hundreds of local uh, African cultures uh, that were completely ignored. And today, we really need to revisit and, and transform our conservation paradigm with at least giving some space for, for those other types of relationship between people and nature that still exist. Some have disappeared, but some are, are still existing in the landscape. The second uh, 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 framework is a, a landscape approach. This is crucial because we need to make sure that protected areas are not isolated in their landscape. They need to talk to the other land users that are around them and, and the stakeholders that are around. And um, so it means that, for example, park management plan needs to be embedded in landscape management plan and make sure that there is a process to make those uh, land users uh, talk to each other. So I'm talking about not only uh, regulatory ecosystem services, but also provisioning services. And I think the work, for example, by uh, Louise Swimmer in, in Kruger is exactly going uh, toward that. Trying to have people benefiting concretely from, from protected areas. And that's a way to have a, a more buy-in of people for, for protected areas. There is also a second uh, important um, component in, in that is that by making the different land users communicating, you will recreate ecological functioning between the different types of, of savannas that I've been talking about from the beginning. Finally, the unit within those landscapes will be natural resources. And so we, we have, I mean, we, we, we can use the legacy of Ostrom and our colleagues about social ecological system approach, in which you can have uh, the management of common pool resources by uh, different types of actors governed by a set of institutions. And um, we need probably to broaden our, our definition of natural resources. We always think about wildlife. Okay, we always think about wildlife, but in fact, there are many other types of natural resources on which the livelihoods of people living in TFCA depend. So we talk about mainly water, rangeland, soil, wood, and other types of natural resources. So we need to design governance systems for all these types of resources in complex landscape uh, in TFCAs, or in the frameworks that provide TFCA that is, that is already there. So, some of you may say, okay, that's that theory, we've heard about it already, we know all these things, but how do, you, how do you implement it? It's complex. I agree with that. But we tried something. Uh, uh, so in 2017, we, we, we wrote a project proposal for the Prosuli project based on the observation of that imbalance between what is invested towards conservation and development, and we decided to create that project for the benefit mainly of promoting sustainable livelihoods in TFCA, with no conservation a priori, no conservation perspective at all. And by doing so, we would still achieve TFCA goals because that's part of, of its definition. And then, as a, a, a group of researchers from, from France, from Zimbabwe, Botswana, Mozambique, uh, we decided that we were not expert enough to decide what we can do to improve the livelihoods of the people. So we decided to not impose a, a pre-written project onto 
the people we wanted to support. And so the, 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 the project proposal, we told the donor, we're not going to define the activities, we're just going to, to define the participatory approach that we are going to use in order to uh, define those activities with uh, local stakeholders. So the project was, was funded. Uh, we had four sites, uh, one site in the Okavango Delta, uh, two sites uh, in the periphery of Wange and in the periphery of Gonareju National Park, uh, and one site in the periphery of Kruger, but in, in Mozambique. And so we implemented our participatory approach in all these four sites, and it took us a long time. It took, depending on the site, it took us between one year and one year and a half to, to make sure we develop trust we make sure that uh, a local stakeholder understand exactly what we were talking about with this new form of project and to define the activities that will be implemented within the project. So I will just cite, uh, I mean, uh, give an example of, of future workshops uh, or foresight or anticipatory uh, uh, prospective analysis. Uh, those should be tools that are used every time you implement a project. Um, in that, case, in that case, we put together the, the local stakeholders and the different expertise in, in, uh, in the landscape. And during three days, we thought about different types of future that could happen from, from today. And by doing that, you can uh, um, do a backstepping process and say, what can I do today in order to avoid such future or go towards this one? And I will just stop on, on one... Um, one output of this, uh, of this workshop that has been recently uh, published, um, it's, it, it was about uh, defining the five most important driving forces in each of these uh, communities. And so, um, what, what, what did this, this uh, um, TFCA resident uh, tell us? The first thing is that they say that governance is, is essential. Governance within the community, between the community and local authorities, state authorities, and governance between community and foreigners, like us, implementing projects with them. And this refers, of course, directly to the second component of environmental justice. The second message was that local culture was very important and was under threat. And they clearly told us that each time you have something from the outside coming in, like a technical innovation, a new seed, a new practice. This is a threat, this is perceived as a threat for local culture. And it means that each time we start a project defined, predefined from the outside, it starts with a negative mark, negative perceptions in the area, and, and that may compromise its success beyond the lifespan of the project. And finally, when you ask people what do they want in terms of improving their livelihoods, they asking to get support about what they already know what to do, not about wildlife conservancies or, or, or any type of, um, any type of uh, other uh, activities. They know farming, they know cropping, they know livestock, uh, um, livestock farming. And so that's where they need help because they can feel already the, the, the impact of climate change and other different types of global changes. And of course, what is absent from those driving forces is the wildlife economy. After 20 years in the CFCAs, they don't identify the wildlife economy as a driving force, as something that will be important for them in the future. So we implemented those activities uh, defined by local stakeholders. In fact, they implemented, they co-designed, we co-designed with them, and they implemented the activities. We tried to empower uh, the different individuals within the communities that needed to be empowered to implement those activities, uh, providing training, technical training, training on governance systems around. The, so here you have an example about uh, a solar power borehole that was created with an irrigation uh, um, garden. And the, the, this whole process is the idea is that the assumption is that by increasing the appropriation of the activities by uh, local stakeholders, uh, you would increase the probability of the sustainability of the management of these natural resources in the long run and even after the, life, the lifespan of the project. So the project ended in December, so we don't know yet if we have been successful. We'll know in, a year of, in, year, um, in one year, two years, five years, if those activities are still going on. So 
In each of the sites, we did uh, uh, lots of different types of activities that were selected by local stakeholders, so uh, uh, irrigation gardens, uh, livestock production, livestock health, uh, collective herding in Botswana with um, NGO clothes, uh, lots of different uh, types of, of, of activities. And I have two main messages here about that, is that the first one is that um, all if not, uh, most, if not all, of these activities are compatible with the shared landscape. It's about con uh, concentrating uh, crop production in very small areas in the irrigation scheme, not large ones, small ones, uh, that were, uh, that so that people could uh, manage them easily, and uh, working on uh, livestock keeping, but also uh, uh, rangeland management. And we had some uh, initiatives by uh, groups of women that said, that this river used to flow, it's not flowing anymore, we need help to, to see if we can restore that. So this is very compatible with the shared landscape that we've been uh, discussing, and it, will provide, and it will produce a form of savannas uh, that is, I think, uh, very acceptable, even from a conservation perspective. The second uh, point is that the main outputs of the project are not what you see here. Even if that helps, obviously, the livelihoods of the people, the main output is the capacitation of local stakeholders into being able to stop being passive actors of their livelihood, waiting for projects to be imposed on them, but being more proactive and deciding what they can do for their livelihoods and for their well-being. And we had some amazing uh, emergence of, of, uh, of, of things. For example, that a document was written by three young Nambian people from the Wange uh, site. They decided to go and, and, and interview the elders of the villages and other groups within the community. And they wrote, uh, so those young people were uh, like uh, young teachers in the village, but from the community. And they wrote that document, Nurturing a Culture of Respect, a Nambian Perspective for Biosphere Sustainability. I can share this document if you want. We, the project only supported the submission of that, of that document to the PBS Call for Proposal, but otherwise it's really 100% uh, from those young uh, uh, Nambian guys. And it's nurturing a culture of respect within the community, with others from outside the communities, but also a respect of nature. And it provides uh, um, another type of relationship between people and nature, which is much more integrated than the one that we have been uh, using for our conservation paradigm. So I don't have time to give you more details about that, that project. We, we, we published that paper recently that provides a bit more uh, information about, about the process, um, but I think it's time for me now to, to conclude. So, what, I'm, what I would like to say is, well, first I would like to go back to, to environmental justice. Uh, we believe this is crucial. If you apply that properly, I mean, you'll be on the right tracks. Um, we've heard about that. Uh, we have been hearing about that, I guess, for many years. Uh, but we don't, we don't do it, we don't implement it. Because it's, we are not experts in that, uh, uh, and we need support from social sciences, and we need time, and we need resources, uh, and it's difficult to convince the donors, to convince uh, 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 a whole um, set of actors to change the way they implement projects and do uh, things. So we strongly believe that the future of savannas is outside protected areas, and it's probably about uh, uh, relocating uh, uh, TFCA residents at the center of the governance systems in those, uh, in those TFCAs. Um, this co-design of shared landscape, promoting land sharing, um, how will it look like? So we don't, of course we don't uh, uh, promote the opening of protected areas to, to people, but uh, uh, as I said, uh, more interaction, more res natural resource use, sustainable natural resource use with protected areas. Obviously, outside protected areas, you won't have conservation objectives such as uh, resident population of elephants, lion, and of buffalo, but of course you know that most of the biodiversity doesn't, re uh, doesn't um, belong to the vertebrate diversity. It's about soil diversity, it's about invertebrate diversity. And we heard the first day that arthropod diversity and abundance is higher outside protected area than inside protected area. So here is, can be a, a, um, an opportunity to conserve a different form of biodiversity, and there is a very nice hypothesis about those shared landscapes 
will they provide more, more biodiversity than only the biodiversity in protected areas? Because we assume, as conservationists, that outside protected areas is less diversity than inside. It's a subset of diversity than inside protected areas, but maybe not. And so those shared landscapes will also provide local development and um, well-being objectives through sustainable livelihoods. And to do that, we need to work with a, a, a a wider set of, of specialists, agricultural specialists, uh, extension services of, of governments, of course, as I said, social scientists and, uh, and, uh, and many more uh, uh, types of expertise. So I'm, I'm not saying it's a golden bullet. It, you have huge, huge challenges to achieve that. But if you say that I'm utopic, I would say that you are blind because that's I mean, if you want to conserve savannah to a large extent and achieve the 30% objective, that's the only way to go. We need to address those wicked problems outside protected areas and, and try to make sure that it's not going to be only savannas protected inside protected areas and outside we just don't care about it and it will be lost to uh, biodiversity. And so I think we, we have made the point also that to do that, we need to reconsider our relationship between the, the relationship that we perceive about people and nature. We need to transform it, and it's a huge task, but as I said, I, I, we strongly believe that it's a necess necessary task to uh, conserve savannas in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Alex. Uh, we've got two minutes. Uh, that was great for setting the scene for the session, but also to remind us a little bit about what we've achieved in 20 years of TFCS. So thanks so much for that. Uh, questions? Okay, we've got Urs and Gianluca. Thanks for that. Um, I got a question which you kind of already raised in the talk is, uh, the connection between the wildlife resource in protected areas and the benefits derived from the community and the real linkage with that because in many cases these benefits are disseminated without any clear linkage to the wildlife and the conservation underpinning the generation of Sorry. those and so how are you addressing that? So can you repeat because the, the sound is, is not coming? I was just uh, trying to get an understanding how you address the connection between the wildlife conservation effort and the beneficiation to the community so the communities are really clear about where, where those resources are coming from because that link is often missing. Hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, that's true. Um, um, but when we, we talk about uh, natural resource use in protected areas, we, we don't have to talk about wildlife. I mean, it depends what is your definition of wildlife. Wildlife is wide plants and wild animals, or is it only vertebrates? So if it's uh, wild plants and, uh, and, uh, and other forms, of, uh, I mean, other animals and vertebrates, I mean, it's, um, it's um, I mean, you can have multiple type of use. And uh, I think from what, uh, I don't know if Louise, Louise is here, but uh, from, uh, let's see, here. <laughs> uh, uh, clearly, I mean, uh, I think she would be in a better position to answer that, but the fact that you're going and in, the, in the protected area and collect some resources, uh, create a links and reconnect you with that area, that place, I would say. So to some extent, I think that's part of the... Of course, if you, if you bring the wildlife outside and just distribute it, that's, that's different than that coming into the protected area and collecting it yourself. It's a big difference. Quick one as well. Yeah, no, thanks, Alex. Um, I just would like to know, according with your experience and with this kind of approach, if you have seen an improvement in the relationship between the communities uh, and the conservation area management, and also if you seen also a reduction of the um, significant reduction on the human wildlife conflict in those communities. Yeah. So this, this was not the objective of the project, as I said. The project was mainly to go for to improve uh, uh, livelihoods. So there was no conservation outputs that we were expecting. However, um, so we, 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 filmed, uh, we, we had a movie, and in the movie you have one, one guy from Gonarejou uh, uh, Conservation Trust saying that human wildlife conflict had, had, 
reduced since the project. Well, I don't really believe him. Maybe he was just saying it for because he was he was. Uh, but uh, he said that because uh, of those new water points, people don't, were not relying anymore on those uh, pools in, during the dry season in the Wenezi River, and so they were less attacked by crocodiles, for example. So that's one thing. But um, I mean, we 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 tend to separate. And once again, I'm, I'm coming back to the relationship between people and nature. We tend to separate uh, people being better and the fact that they recognize that nature is part of that feeling better. But in fact, it's connected. So just the, the, by the fact that people are, are better in life, it's, it's linked to nature. Maybe not the protected area by itself, but it's linked to nature. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. And please catch him during the break, because I think this has definitely stimulated some, some questions and discussion. Uh, so next up, we've got Laura. Thank you, Alex. Laura is going to talk to about to us a little bit about miscommunication between communities and conservation areas. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Danny, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Alex, for waking us up this morning. Uh, my name is Laura, I'm with WWS South Africa. Um, Lindy, my colleague, and I was talking last night and we said it's only in the bush where an event actually starts at eight o'clock in the morning and everyone is here bright and early. Uh, I think for the rest of us, it's. It's actually quite an early start <laughs> for some of us. Um, but yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Today I'm gonna present to you um, some feedback from a research study we did, a very simple and straightforward uh, communication needs assessment we did on the flow of communication between protected areas um, and communities. And we did this um, in partnership with um, Nourish, which is an NPO in Acorn Hook, who helped us um, to do the survey and to also analyze the results. Um, and we basically did this uh, research because communication is, I think we all can agree, a quite a critical element to any good relationship. All of us are in relationships, whether it's with your parents, your partner, your siblings, those are sometimes a little bit more difficult relationships to manage for many of us, but communication is really key. Open, regular, consistent communication is key to, to a good relationship. And the relationships between communities and protected areas, at the very least to say, is quite complex. Now, we recently celebrated, um, all of us, World Wildlife Day, and the theme for this year was partnerships for conservation. And I think we can easily replace that partnership word with relationships for conservation, because we know that most, if not all, conservation challenges requires, it cannot be solved by one person or one institution. It requires partnerships and relationships between people from different sectors, different expertise, to work together to solve these um, conservation challenges. And the Greater Kruger area also has its conservation challenges, of which, for example, wildlife crime and broader safety and security uh, are just a few of those conservation challenges. And again, it requires relationships and partnerships to address these, uh, address these challenges. And these partnerships include also our neighboring communities um, that live around these uh, protected areas. So good communication between communities and protected areas and conservation agencies is really important to foster those relationships and partnerships we need to address these challenges. So we conducted a study in the southern parts of the Greater Kruger with a private reserve, as well as 110 respondents from eight villages um, surrounding that reserve. We met them at their homes um, to understand, you know, what kind of communication tools uh, protected area, the protected area and conservation agencies use, but also the, communi uh, the communities use to communicate with one another. And so what we basically looked at is just what channels do they use and how effective are they? Um, what, what are the tools that they're using and what are some of the opportunities to really improve some on these communication challenges that might exist uh, between these different stakeholders? So we did find that 70% of our community respondents said that they've never received any information from their neighboring protected area or information just about their protected area. But interestingly, 93% of them said that they would really like to uh, engage more with their neighboring uh, protected area, receive information sp specifically around some of the projects that the reserve does uh, in their community. 
So we looked at, so what are these methods then that protected areas use to communicate with communities when they say that most of them don't receive any information? So most of our protected areas, um, and also conservation agencies, they rely on their community liaison officers to be that channel and that link with their neighboring communities. So these community liaison officers are employed by the parks, the reserves, and the NGOs. Then they are responsible for mediating and managing that relationship uh, between the park, the reserve, and, and the communities. And they are responsible to act in the best interest of their employer, but also the communities. And to me, these people are really conservation heroes. I think they have, probably from all of, from all of us, the most difficult job um, to do. And I'll encourage you, there's also a poster this afternoon that also looks a little bit more into what uh, capacity our community layers and officers need, how can we better support them to do their jobs better. So I encourage you to also look at that um, this afternoon. But the protected areas and the conservation agencies, they rely on these CLOs to attend community meetings, meet with traditional authorities, to convey messaging or information, which will then hopefully trickle through um, to, to the broader community. They do also use other forms of communication, like their social media, loudspeakers were used, they also rely quite a lot on word of mouth, radio flyers, posters, and so on, but also to a lesser extent, they use SMSs, email, um, newspapers, um, but not that often. The tools and the methods that communities say they use to communicate with protected areas is mostly through the CLO at these community meetings uh, and sometimes a phone call here or there, but it really shows you that the p real and perceived ways of communicating with, uh, from communities to protected areas, communities doesn't see a lot of options for them to actually talk to their um, neighboring um, protected areas apart from through their CLOs. So there is a case here a little bit about the broken telephone. So then we asked people, okay, well, what, what do you, how do you prefer to then receive information if these tools are not necessarily as effective as protected areas and conservation agencies might think that they are? So elders and traditional authorities indicated that they still prefer the more conventional way. You know, face-to-face -face meetings, uh, where you meet with them in person or you come and talk to them at community meetings. However, everyone, or almost everyone under the age of 50 said, you know, we, pref we would like to receive information through di digital mediums. Um, the reason for that is, one, they don't really attend, most of them don't attend community meetings, so they don't get information through that way. Also, some people indicated that they don't trust their community leadership. So they see their community uh, leadership as gatekeepers of information. So they're not sure that they're actually getting the information um, that's been provided uh, by protected areas, especially where it comes to like employment opportunities. Uh, and they would prefer to rather receive the information firsthand rather than through um, their community leadership. So our recommendation from what we found is that we should continue to engage with um, you know, our traditional authorities and our community leadership, um, but this should not be the only way of communicating with, with our communities. Um, so let's be a lot more creative and innovative about how we engage with our communities. What we've also found is that a lot of the information is kind of one-way information. It's about protected areas and conservation agencies talking to communities rather than talking with them and having dialogue with them. So finding ways to, to really rather have a conversation rather than just relaying information. So first of all, understand what your community needs and what their information needs are. Do not assume that they do not use certain platforms, they probably do. Um, but using social media and using digital media is a much more creative way to, to reach a broader group of people. So, um, some of these might seem obvious, and they are being used by protected areas, but we found it's not, it's, it's been used in a very limited way, and it hasn't reached its potential yet. So WhatsApp groups, um, Facebook groups, um, some protected areas are now also looking at apps now to see how they can communicate uh, and have, have um, better dialogue with their communities. And then also other more innovative uh, social media platforms like TikTok. And if you don't know what TikTok is, you probably need a communications person to help you with your communications. Great, thank you very much, everyone. Couple of minutes for some questions. Uh, Tally? Um, you talked about initiating a dialogue. 
but to what extent do you ask the question, what do you need to tell us into protected areas, not so much what we need to tell you about protected areas? Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's a really important question because I think traditionally it's always been one way or often it's been a lot of one way communication. I think, it's, I think it comes down to not being fearful of having those conversations because I know a lot of the conversations that do take place when, we, when we're willing to have open dialogue with our neighboring communities takes a lot of courage. Uh, and to be open to, to hear what people have to say and what their needs are, and sometimes it's not even conservation related, you know. I think a lot of people from our engagements that we've had um, engaging with communities, people just appreciate an opportunity to, to raise their concerns um, and what it is that they need. Um, they don't, we, we, I think we are also sometimes scared to have these conversations because we think it creates now an expectation that if we raise our concerns with you, you have to address it immediately. But I think we've found a lot of our engagements, people appreciate just an opportunity to, to, to be heard. Um, and I think, I think that can be quite powerful. So to, have, to, be, to be willing and have that courage to actually meet with people face to face and have that conversation, I think is, um, is worth doing. Thanks, Laura, that's great. Um, we've run out of time, so I would like to sort of hand, thank you so much, that was great. I think we can all improve our communication. Um, and we look forward to working a little bit. And thanks for also alerting everybody with, for the poster. I think our community liaison officers do a, an excellent job and, and they do need more assistance and support. So, so yeah, so think about it, read about it, and look forward to engaging on it more. Um, our next speaker is going to take us a little away from Kruger and Kruger and the Southern African communities to Benin, um, Jean Huge. I've massacred that name, sorry, I did try. Okay. <laughs> Conservation conflict following a management shift in Pajari National Park in Benin. Thanks, Jean. Okay, good morning, everyone. So my name is uh, Jean Huget. I agree it's a difficult name to pronounce, so it's fine. I work at the Open University of the Netherlands and at the Free University of Brussels in uh, Belgium. And today I'm going to talk about uh, conservation conflict, uh, which happens uh, after a management shift, but also before the management shift in uh, Penjari National Park in Benin in West Africa. So, of course, this is a result of teamwork, and uh, I will be presenting a paper that the whole team, whose names you see there, uh, has worked on. So, indeed, we're quite far away now from South Africa and from Kruger. So, for those who don't know West Africa at all, here's a map of the savanna ecosystem over there. Uh, Benin is uh, yeah, situated there in the middle. So, is that the pointer? It is, yeah, so that's Benin. So the park we'll focus on is here, in the Sudan zone. Uh, but I wanted to also show the Dahomey Gap, which is the gap between the Western African uh, forest zone and the Central African uh, guinea congolian forest zone here. So that's where we're situated with these West African savannas. So the Penjari National Park, on which we focus, is situated in a transboundary uh, conservation area. So it links very well with what we've heard earlier today. It's situated within the WAP, the WAP complex, which is the W Park in Niger, the Arli Park in uh, Burkina Faso, and Penjari in Benin. And it's one of the last places in West Africa, basically, where you have uh, large populations of uh, large herbivores and also lions. So I know here in Kruger this seems like logical that these animals are there, but in West Africa it's much rarer and there are much smaller populations. So it's kind of an important place uh, conservation-wise. And the largest tract of this transboundary park is in Benin. So we can't talk about this part of the world uh, right now without mentioning the security context over there, which is very volatile, to say the least. So this is from a very recent paper by a colleague of mine, uh, Simon Lust. And he looked at all the violent incidents and like the, the places here, uh, which are like colored, are places where violent extremist organizations, which is the term they use, are actually active. And as you can see here, that's where the park is. And here in Burkina and Niger, you have lots of security incidents. And also Penjari National Park has been plagued by this incident. Which means that, of course, for the local populations and for tourism, it's very hard to you know, make, a, make a business there and make a living. So we zoom in on Penjari National Park. You have a graph there. And you can see that the park itself is divided, divided sorry, in different zones. We'll come to that later. So uh, you often see that. So that's the northern part of the park, which is the core zone, which is really aimed at conservation, where only tourism and research can be done. Then you have a hunting zone, 
and here the, yeah, at the fringes you have people uh, who live there. So there's control, they call it the zone of controlled occupation in the jargon. And Penjaro is a UNESCO biosphere reserve, so you could say it's just a label, a name that the reserve gets, but it also means that it has to follow this zoning approach. So you have a core area in the middle, a buffer zone and a transition area. And in Penjari, this translates to this buffer zone is actually the hunting zone, as they call it there. And the transition area in uh, Penjari is the zone of controlled occupation. So just to say that there's multiple stakeholders, of course, who use that area and who have opinions and perspectives on that particular area. The area has gone through lots of changes, shifts in uh, management in the last few years. So in 1954, it was designated as a reserve under colonial French administration. In 61, Benin gained independence. The area uh, became a national park. Uh, and then in 86, it got a UNESCO label. So when it was a national park in the beginning, the first few decades, people were not allowed to go in. So it was very strict, uh, very strong uh, separation between uh, people and the park. And then from 1993 onwards, a new participatory governance system was set up with uh, a national level uh, organization, Senagref, and a local level uh, organization, which is Avigref, which is like a, a board of village representatives who can talk then to the people from Senagref, which is the Benin national government, basically. And then from 2017 onwards, there was a big shift in management, and our study started after that shift. So we, we've looked at how this shift has possibly shifted how uh, people look at the park and what they accept, uh, ex expect sorry, from the park and from its stakeholders. So the arrows there are very schematic. So the red arrows, uh, they show you that there is some kind of conflict between these stakeholders, and the white arrows, they show you the, uh, the financial flows that are happening here. So now we move from this uh, management, which was dominated by the national government, to a public-private uh, participation with African Parks Network, which is APN over there, uh, who is now a major player in the management of the park. So yeah, I'll skip that one. So in our study, we focused on mapping uh, the perspectives of the stakeholders who are involved in uh, Penjari National Park. And uh, we also wanted to gain insight into where there is consensus and where there is disagreement, because this, of course, can have direct implications for management and for policy recommendations. So we use the methodology, which is called uh, Q methodology, which, and for that, uh, we looked first at the literature, we looked at Web of Science, the classic literature review, in which we looked at 45 documents, which is not that much, it's all that popped up on Web of Science and Google Scholar on Penjari, so there's not a lot of publications compared to other parks. And from that, we extracted some fragments and then a lot of statements. So this was published in Biological Conservation, for those of you who are really passionate about the topic, so just showing it here. And now diving into this Q methodology. So basically, in one sentence, Q methodology is an approach in which you ask participants to rank statements, and then they have to rank them from disagreement to agreement, basically. The participants do that in face-to-face -face meetings with a facilitator or a researcher. All these participants do that, one after the other. They're not together in a room, so you don't have any group think or dominance bias. Uh, the bias that can be there, of course, is the facilitator, but of course you try to uh, minimize that. So basically, you start with this literature. You gather as much data as possible, as much information as possible about a topic, in this case, about the management of that park. And then you try to look for statements that show that there is some disagreement or some possible subjective opinion on all these, uh, these topics. And out of that, you make statements, synthesis statements. And these statements, you will present these to the participants, which will then, who will then rank it. So every participant will make this kind of ranking grid, a kind of matrix, where they rank their statements from disagree to agree most. Uh, the P sample, these are just the participants, and then you see how it looks like. The method can be face-to-face, -face, like in our case, or all, also online. So actually, Q methodology is a kind of inverse factor analysis. So the explanatory variables here are the participants, and the dependent variables are actually the Q sorts. And the Q sorts are these, well, matrices, basically, where all the participants rank their statements. So after that, you do an analysis. So it's principal component analysis, classic factor analysis. And out of that, you basically get, instead of having, uh, in our case, 45, or yeah, I think we had 45 participants, instead of having 45 uh, individual opinions, you get a few clusters of opinions. So it's much easier to work with that. So you get a semi-quantitative mapping of the subjectivity uh, of the participants and of their opinions on this particular part. And then you try to interpret these clusters of opinion, of course. You try to understand what it means. What does cluster one mean? What does cluster two mean? And where do they overlap? And where is there a lot of disagreement? 
So we'll get to that in a moment. So that's how it looks like. In the left column, you can see some examples of uh, the statements that people were provided with. I've just seen like 10 minutes ago that for the first line, the numbers are missing there. But let's focus on the second one here. So one of the statements was fencing the PNP, Benjari National Park, is necessary to safeguard the wildlife and to uh, minimize human wildlife conflict. So you can see that Q factor one, so the first cluster of opinion, and Q factor two, they're quite different there. Uh, and but they're still not that far from each other. So if you look at the rank, a Q factor two people rank this as minus two, so they disagree with this, and a Q factor two people, sorry, have a neutral view on it. So that's how the results basically look like. And the rank you see there is what you see in the matrices. The z-score is, uh, well, basically saying the same, but without having been translated to the minus three to plus three scale. Okay. So our findings, we've seen that there are actually two major clusters of opinion. And these clusters may not surprise you that much, but we'll get to that in a moment. So one is really that conservation of the park is for the sake of nature, so you recognize the intrinsic value of nature there. And then the other one is for the sake of human use, which is a more utilitarian framing, which we've talked about also yesterday and the day before. We heard that. So these are the two major clusters. And so, for example, in the first perspective or the first cluster, you can see that, for example, they say that agroforestry is key uh, to reduce conflict and to make sure that conservation is effective in the park. And the second one, which is more, I would say, uh, yeah, development-oriented, you can see, or human-oriented, uh, uh, then they say, for example, that restricting access to wildlife uh, for the whole park is not a good idea. We have to share the land. So the land sharing, we heard also in the first presentation uh, today. So you could, of course, describe these perspectives in much more detail, which is also what we did in the paper. But I think it's interesting also to look at the profile of the respondents. So who says what? Who has what kind of opinion about the park? I won't go into detail here, but you can see that uh, the higher the level of formal education here, uh, the higher the support for discourse one, for the first cluster of opinion, which is like uh, nature-based. Uh, and um, you could also see that the more, well, literacy, the more literate uh, respondents there also had the tendency to support discourse number one, the conservation-oriented one, uh, stronger, uh, more strongly, sorry. So we did a uh, logistic regression analysis to find these, uh, yeah, these correlations, basically. So there's agreement, actually, on many issues. There's no extreme polarization, despite the name that I gave to these two clusters. And I think it's interesting from a management perspective to use Q methodology to look at where there is actually consensus. So yes, there is conflict when it comes to the management of the park, but there's also, I would say, hidden agreement. So people who do not expect to agree on many issues actually do agree on many issues. So in a way, you could see Q methodology as a way to, to show that, and to show that polarization maybe is unnecessary in that case. So for example, when it comes to participation, everyone agrees that this is key. Everyone agrees that also there should be more participation, that there should be more communication, uh, to come back also to the previous presentation. Tourism should be promoted, but of course that's the heart now with the volatile security context, should create more jobs for locals, so everyone agrees on that. Even the people who are, of course, focused more on these intrinsic values of nature. Uh, okay, and then they also agree about the zoning, these different zones, core zone, buffer zone, transition zone, everyone agrees that this is actually a good way to do that. So what we try to do is not only to look at this hidden consensus and also, well, uh, hidden disagreements, but we also try to combine Q with other methods. Because Q should not be like a standalone method. Uh, of course, it's interesting, purely out of intellectual curiosity, to map these perceptions. But yeah, that's merely academic. So we want it to be something that is so, as much as possible, grounded in the management of the park. And within the frame of a UNESCO project which focused on uh, mapping ecosystem services, we also combined Q methodology with focus groups and with a TESA tool, which is a specific tool to assess ecosystem services. And based on this combination of tools, we try to come up with recommendations for management and policy. So now the question is, and I'll end with that, is how unique these uh, stakeholder perspectives on Penjari are. So as you've seen, this clustering of perspectives that I've shown, like the intrinsic value of nature and the more, well, nature for the people value, uh, perspective, sorry, reflects what we know from the literature. Like we have heard uh, Mace's paper uh, mentioned here before, here at the conference, and you can really recognize that. So nature for itself, you could say, or nature despite people versus nature for the people. So okay, that's good, so it's not unique. It happens in a lot of places. But on specific statements, the differences are quite high. And that's what's interesting, I think. So we shouldn't probably look at Q just as like, okay, giving us the general 
stressors, but also focus on these hidden agreements and hidden disagreements. Uh, and also what we see here in the case of Benjari specifically, there's been lots of shifts in the management of the park, also in the recent past, and that has certainly created some kind of, you know, I would say, stakeholder fatigue, because people are fed up with all these changes and they don't know how it works anymore. They don't know whom to talk to. On the other hand, it could also allow for some adjustments. And what we've seen uh, with all the stakeholders we talked to in the Q methodology and also in the post-sorting interviews that we did after the people ranked the statements, it is actually quite some openness and that people want to collaborate more. So yeah, that was actually quite optimistic in the end, I would say. Uh, but the risk, of course, is the more general uh, geopolitical context of, of the region there. Okay, with that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jean, for that interesting presentation. We've got one minute remaining. We can take a question. Questions? Okay, Urs. <laughs> Really nice presentation, really Thank systematic. Um, I was uh, curious, so one of the things that came out is income generation, which obviously uh, that of often comes out, but some work we've done uh, in communal areas adjacent to the private nature reserves here. The communities indicated that community benefits, which were shared by everyone, was more important to them than their individual household incomes. Did you find something similar in the area where you were working? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, and thank you for that question. Uh, we've seen that, but the problem it, in the Benjari case is that there are quite a lot of mistrust at different levels. So between these Avi Gref, so these kind of uh, village board people, and the people of the village themselves, there's quite some mistrust. And then there's lots of mistrust between Avi Gref and then African parks and the Beninese government. So it becomes really hard for people to come up with, I would say, workable solutions to come to this real you know, benefit sharing across the community. So I think, yeah, I agree with what you say, it's probably also the case there, but I think it will take some time before this mistrust is actually overcome. Can you just explain what Avi Gref is? I didn't quite understand that. Sorry, because I don't the really... Avi Gref, what, what oh, yeah, is that? Okay. Avi Gref, uh, yeah, it's a French acronym, and it stands for, uh, it's representatives from the villages that are um, like in a committee, and they are the people who talk to the Beninese government, and now to the Beninese government and to African parks. So there's like the, the middlemen coming from the villages, and they're elected by the villages. Yeah. But then the people who live in the villages, of course, there's many more of them, and there's kind of a distrust between Avigref and, and the people who are actually living on the field. Yeah. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Okay, great. So we are now moving on to, I think it might be our first mammal talk if we could even be called that, of this conference. So how's that for, everybody keeps saying that, you know, it's not all about the big five and things, but we're on to day three and it's the first time a big animal is mentioned. Isn't that amazing? So Herbert Prince is gonna take us to the futures of African buffalo. How may that affect choosing now? Thanks, Herbert. Thank you very much. Now we have been talking about biodiversity and we have been talking about land sharing and land sparing, and we have been talking about community participation and people participation, um, and we decided to let Buffalo be spoken for. Yeah, seems like it'll work for a bit, so you can go ahead. It's working, huh? Can I get back to the slide? And so we, we um, uh, asked a number of people uh, to start uh, thinking about the futures of the African buffalo. And um, the interesting thing is that how may the future affect what we are doing now? And that is a fundamental uh, way of thinking. Um, in business organizations, that's very normal. Uh, you think about what you want to achieve, and then you uh, uh, reverse engineering. Uh, uh, you do reverse engineering, and you're asking yourself, so how can I achieve that goal then in future? And so uh, I give the talk, but I give the talk uh, also on behalf of Alex Caron. And uh, what you will discover is that the conclusion that uh, I am presenting is slightly different from that conclusion that was reached before. And I will explain why that is going to happen. And I do that with Philippe Chardonnay, 
and with uh, Daniel Cornelis and uh, with Robin Bourgeois. And uh, we have been working on this because we are working together on a book uh, that is going to be published very soon about the ecology and management of the African buffalo. And for all of you to, uh, who want to read that book, it will be an open access Cambridge University Press book. So it will be uh, freely downloadable for everyone who wants to read it. Um, and uh, we did that with approximately 70 co-authors, and most of these co-authors are members of the ICN Antelope Specialist Group. Now, the future is not unknown, it is unknowable. And that, was, that statement was made by one of the major, most important, fundamental economists of our uh, last 150 years. Uh, and he said, fundamentally, you cannot know the future. And so, um, but it does not mean that the future does not exist. And that is a very important thing to realize. So you cannot know what is going to happen, but you can think about what is going to happen, and, and that is an important thing to do. And so, may, me, uh, may we assume that there will be still a possible future for the African buffalo in uh, Africa, and what is it? Now, life is complicated. So we want to think only one generation ahead. Now, it's, it's impossible to predict what is going to happen uh, a century from now, uh, and it's difficult enough to think what is going to happen one generation from now. And so there are possible futures emerging. Will it go totally extinct? That is a possibility, you can think about it. Will it go perhaps extinct in the wild and only be in farms? That is a possible future for the species. Will it only go extinct in West Africa, but not in East Africa and South Africa? And perhaps will it only survive in private game concessions? And so what does it mean for what we have to do today? Now, how can... Good. Yeah, so, so, so these are different futures that may emerge, and that is what you have to think about. <laughs> yeah? Shall I now use this? Yeah. yeah. There you are. Thanks very much. Um, so can one define that future? And so we try to do that, and uh, there is a, there's futures technology uh, uh, methodology for, uh, in this case, you cannot ask uh, uh, the buffalo to talk for the buffalo, and so we are asking people. And I think people are much more useful to uh, discuss these issues with because people are controlling uh, land, economy, and all these sort of things, and the buffalo are not. And so, so we did a consultation of approximately 60 people, and we asked them about all these sort of drivers that potentially may influence the future. And you don't have to read that, that is not the intention at all, you can read that in the paper. The issue is that there are many, many drivers that influence the future. For example, the state of global tourism. You know, we think about tourism as a thing that is given. Uh, we have seen with the COVID how it can be affected by one event. And in Australia, at this moment, tourism is not coming back, whatever the government of Australia is trying to achieve. Um, and so that future that the people were thinking about their investments, about their hotels, and all these sort of things, uh, is not happening the way uh, it is panning out at this moment. Uh, you can also think about the state of poverty. All these things have effect. And, um, and so, so we had that list of factors. The, it was a bottom-up process. And then uh, we did a selection of the driving forces. Um, and as I said, there are many, many, many factors. And you don't have to read them, but we took them into uh, account. And uh, the point is that there are these factors are interacting with each other, and, um, and that is why you do a futures analysis. Now, this is a picture of a very interesting buffalo subspecies, or whatever you would like to call it. Uh, it's the northern savanna buffalo. It's occurring in West Africa and, and northern Central Africa. Um, would it have been foreseeable that in the 90, when you were in the 1940s that this species would now be nearly extinct? And so, would the people then have discerned the driving forces in the 1940s to predict the future that is now happening at this moment? And I think they should have done a futures analysis at that time, and many of the mistakes that have been 
done in conservation in Western Africa could have prevented if they had done that in the 1940s. And so, so we worked on that, and then we started doing a, a, a combination of alternative futures. It, it is a, a thing that you discuss with each other, and we look ahead, and now a, a thing that is becoming very important, who of you is younger than 30? Can you raise your hand? Yeah? So you have to imagine how the world is going to look like when you are about 55. So you are mid-career, you have had your first heart attack, and um, <laughs> yeah, so, so that is what you have to think about. Now who is younger uh, between 30 and 40? Yeah? So you have to think when you're going to retire, yeah? And in how is that world going to look like? And I can the same for who is younger, who is between 40 and 50? Yeah? I mean, this is a grim future that you're now thinking about. Yeah? And who is between 50 and 60? Man, then you're talking about 85 years. So, so most of us then stop thinking about the future altogether. And only Norman and I are thinking still about what is happening when we are 95. And, um, well, and I've given up thinking about the future altogether. And um, so let's go ahead again. And so this is, this is one of these things. You can think about the preservation of nature as a dominant mindset in society, uh, preservation of nature versus exploitation of nature. And that you can cross with the political state of African nations, and you can think about political chaos or a general political stability. Now, these are things that are possible in the future. And uh, if you have the combination of preservation of nature and a general political stability, you know, you have a situation that sounds a bit like the Ark of Noah, and that is very good for Buffalo. So Buffalo are happy there. If you think about political chaos and exploitation of nature, you get a bunch of warlords that have their private reserves, eat everything for themselves, and do not share with the people. You can also think about preservation of nature and political uh, chaos. Well, that is a situation that you can classify as goodwill, but no ways. And then the, the one general political stability and exploitation of nature, the future of the African buffalo probably will be peaceful death. Slowly but certainly, it will be whittled away. So, so the nice thing for buffalo is a combination of preservation of nature as a political mindset in society and, and political state of African nations where gen general political stability is, uh, is achieved. Now the nice thing is if you think about that right-hand corner, that is also the best we think for most people in society. So you can also cross the quality of the state the quality of the state in African nations, you know, the thing, the governance is fulfilling only the needs of a few happy people in society versus governance is fulfilling the aspirations of nearly all in society. Versus the state of the Western mindset where the West is dominating, and Alex was referring to that, you know, the colonial mindset that is now becoming the Western mindset that can dominate the discourse where Western worldview supports the notion of wilderness only, is really driving for that idea of wilderness, versus the idea that the West would start supporting the idea of sustainable use. We talk about a lot about sustainable use, but if I go to my friends in the United States or in Europe, uh, there's much more discussion about preservation, wilderness, than about sustainable use. And so, if you cross that again, the one at the right-hand side, goodwill, good use, is, is good for Buffalo. Again, think about it, these are societal things. This is not about ecology, this is about society, how society is panning out in future. If you have a, a wilderness where only the happy few in African society are taking the benefits, you get some sort of a Jurassic Park situation or so. That is a, a very unhappy situation for people, probably totally uns unsustainable, politically speaking. Um, or you can get the, the royal hunting reserves that we had in Europe before. Uh, you can recreate them here in this part of the world as well, if you are in that quadrant uh, to the left. And that is also for po politically probably totally unstable. And the right one, uh, government fulfills the aspirations of all, crossed with Western worldview of wilderness, is leading to conservation conflicts. So, the, the best situation for Buffalo is that situation, and you have to keep that in mind, that probably is best for most people. 
The last one we're showing is many people in, in Africa are talking about African autarky, that you know, the West is dominating, China is dominating, uh, uh, is the economy is too much, we should go more for African autarky. And you can also say, well, no, there is another view that the, the West, China, uh, Brazil, will start uh, the dictating the politics and the economics in our countries here in Africa. And you can cross that with the African population growth, where you get uh, a rural population bigger than an urban population versus an urban population versus a rural population. Both, both possibilities are there. And so you do that again. And um, it is an interesting situation that you can now think about. N none of them is very, very good for African buffalo, but we think that you know, uh, where, where people are modernizing and where people uh, are having not an outer type of view, but a integrated view with the rest of the world's economy is perhaps best. And um, in this situation to the left, where the rural e society is bigger than the urban society, you probably get that modernization will be stifled. Uh, we talked about it before, where, where uh, community leaders are much more conservative than the younger generation. The, the, the community leaders are sitting on top and suppressing that um, versus a situation where uh, you get an urban group of people much bigger than a rural group of people, and there probably modernization is much easier. Now, this is leading you to the final set of conclusions when you think about all these things. There are many future possible, many probable outcomes of all these interplays. You know, the future is perhaps unpredictable, but you can think about that future, and some are more likely than others. And so the, the real message now becomes, when you want a happy future for the African buffalo, so I'm not talking about biodiversity, and that is a fundamental conflict with a discussion like Alex's chapter before, uh, talk before, when Alex is saying we have to think about all biodiversity, you can also be a champion only for one species, one of the big five that we need for tourism. Yeah? Uh, big game tourism is a very important factor in society. Um, then, then you need for that good governance, you need a productive, intensive, and intensified agriculture with an open economy and Buffalo featuring as a sustainable resource and a government delivering society, uh, uh, delivering services for all. And you can do that either with a thriving rural population, but because of intensification, you run into a situation of more land grabbing. So the, the power that you need of the state and society against land grabbing becomes more important. Or you get a thriving ur ur uh, urban population linked to the world economy, but with a everyone having a decent income, local tourism, African tourism becomes very important, and agriculture is well developed so that l some land perhaps in future can be even given back to nature. Now, for those of you who are optimistic about the future and who are optimistic about the future of South Africa, perhaps you recognize this sort of future. That is basically what President Mbeki was believing in when he was talking about African Renaissance. And I think many of us have been looking way too much at the Zuma era, way too much of all the state capture that has been taking place, and many in South African society, but also in other African societies, have forgotten that image of African Renaissance. And I think the amazing outcome, when you start thinking about what is best for the African buffalo, is identical with the concept of African Renaissance. And so any one of you who is a South African citizen, please go back to these days and start thinking about that again. Uh, and don't sit looking back at a broken ESCOM uh, generator, but start thinking about a number of political thinkers in this society who have been thinking about a good future for Africa, a good future for South Africa, which happens to be apparently a good future for African buffalo. And perhaps if you would do that same analysis for African elephant or African lion or whatever, that we have not done that exercise, but it would be interesting to think about it. And so, all other scenarios, and that is a very important message, all other scenarios are not good for the African buffalo. And that is the final conclusions. 
Uh, African autarky may be a false dream. Integration in the world economy is really the best. Land sparing is better than land sharing for the buffalo, and that is where I don't agree with uh, my uh, esteemed colleague Alex. And for many of the NGOs, please stop poaching good people from government services all the time into NGOs' finances by the, by the outside world, because we need good governance, and if you don't have well-trained people, and I'm very happy that I've been uh, educating 50 PhD students in my life, and 48 of them stayed in Africa and stayed in government services or at African universities and did not go overseas for better jobs. And so please stop poaching good people. And that is perhaps the most important message that I can give you today to a good future for the African buffalo. So now I'm coming back to that large mammal. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Prof. <laughs> You've Thank used you. all your time, but yeah. you've definitely stimulated some thinking. I'm sure people will grab you at, at uh, tea time and discuss some futures thinking in terms of conservation. I think it's introducing us as conservationists to futures thinking, which most of the business world have been doing for a while, so thanks. <laughs> so next we've got Haley Clements. Haley is going to be talking to us about the importance of private and community lands to sustainable conservation of Africa's rhinoceros. Good morning, everybody. The quite remarkable conservation success of African rhinos over the past half decade is starting to unravel as a result of growing poaching pressure. These graphs show you the continental numbers of white and black rhinos disaggregated by the countries that contribute the most to those numbers, and as we can see here, the number continentally of white rhinos is now on the decline, and the growth in the black rhino population is starting to diminish. Now, we can hone in on South Africa, who conserves over 80% of the white rhinos and about a third of the black rhinos, and we can disaggregate those national numbers by the different conservation entities that uh, contribute to the conservation of those, those rhinos. So that's the Kruger Park, who for a long time conserved the majority of the, the rhinos. Other South African national parks is Mvelo Wildlife Provincial, um, and then private as well. And what we can see is that the national trend of declining white rhinos, and thereby also the continental trend, is driven to a large extent by these quite significant declines that we see in the Kruger National Park, both of white rhinos and of black rhinos. Now, I don't think this is new news to anybody, but I think what people are less aware of is that we actually see the opposite trend when we look at private rhinos. So the number of white rhinos on private land has actually been increasing over the same decade, and we see a stable population of black rhinos on private land. So the outcome of this is that private landowners in South Africa now conserve over half of the white rhinos in the country and also across the continent, um, and they have consistently conserved, conserved about a quarter of the black rhino. Now, to understand why we might be seeing these different trends in a place like Kruger compared to on a private game reserve, we need to consider these quite different models of rhino conservation. So the Kruger National Park conserves several thousand rhinos over nearly two million hectares, compared to the average private uh, property with rhinos, which conserves about 32 or 34 rhinos over a much smaller area. So we can deduce that having a smaller area and a smaller population might make it easier to protect from poaching than an enormous area like the Kruger with many rhinos. But we, in addition to that, we also see a difference in the resource expenditure on rhino conservation. If we look at that per rhino, there's really an order of magnitude difference in what the average 
private rhino owner is spending protecting their rhinos every year compared to what uh, a place like the Kruger is able to spend per rhino. And this, we think, translates into, or is why we might see these quite different rates of poaching in the Kruger compared to the average private reserve. Now, I'm just showing you Kruger here. The other South African national parks, many of which are smaller, perform quite a bit better. In the provincial reserves, we're seeing about 3% poaching uh, rates, so less than Kruger, but still a lot more than we see on private land. Now, it's also important to realize that this growing role of private and, to a lesser extent, community custodians of rhinos is not just a South African trend. We actually see this across the four major uh, range states of African rhinos. And so if we can consider these, these numbers collectively for continental rhinos, private landowners in the green there conserve 56% of the white rhinos across the continent and about a third of the black rhinos. And we also see this not insignificant role of community rhino custodians as well, particularly for black rhinos where they, in the blue there, conserve about 5% of the continental population. That's largely in South Africa and Namibia. Now, to understand what this means for the resilience of rhino conservation going forward, we need to understand why this exists at all. Why do we see these, these quite substantial contributions of private and community landowners to rhino conservation? And to a large extent, the reason that this exists is because there's been this enabling policy and economic environment. At the core of that has been this devolution of uh, property rights, wildlife use, and to some extent in some countries, ownership rights to individual landowners or communities who can then decide how to manage, sell, breed, buy uh, uh, rhinos. And that is cu coupled with an enabling economic environment, so the ability to hunt small numbers and highly regulated numbers of uh, rhinos. It's a rare species, there's high demand, those hunts go for a, a, a high value. So there's a lot of value at the end market on rhino uh, that private landowners can derive from those hunts. But because of that high value of the end market, that means that the pr price of li alive rhino has also been quite high. And so even if landowners are not hunting rhinos, they can benefit from selling rhinos for quite, quite a high price. And coupled with that is the desirability of, of rhinos to an eco-tourist. So taken together, this enabling policy and economic environment has really incentivized private landowners and also, to a lesser extent, communities to have rhino on their property to grow those populations. The problem, of course, is that this environment is becoming less enabling. We see that over the past decade, the average cost of protecting rhinos from poaching has gone from not very much at all to over two million rand per year, on average, per private property with rhinos. And this is also reflected in a diminished demand for rhinos. We see the uh, price of a live rhino sold on auction has gone in the, in the opposite direction. And so really this, this changing cost-benefit ratio of having rhinos on a private or community property. So to understand what that might mean for the future of half of the white rhinos and a third of the, the black rhinos, we can get some insight into how, pri in this case, private landowners are actually responding to the poaching crisis. And what we're seeing is about a third, or over a quarter of them, 28%, are, are actively disinvesting. They are selling their rhinos, no longer able or willing to, to foot the bill for these growing costs of conserving rhinos on their properties. Most of them, reassuringly, are sticking it out as best they can. They aren't buying or selling, they're just increasing their security costs. And then we see the small portion of landowners that are actually investing in more rhinos. They are uh, making the most of these cheap rhinos that are getting sold by the disinvestors and buying up more rhinos. So because of this diversity and how they're responding, we're not seeing a decline 
in aggregate of rhinos on private and community land, but the increase is really as a result of consolidation onto fewer properties. And recognizing that um, financial incentives are not the only incentives for why private landowners and communities have rhino on, the property, on their properties, we also need to, to understand how long they will be able to, to endure these growing costs. Um, and so we need to understand, particularly for the investors, why is it that they're investing in more rhinos? And some of the speculation is that they're investing in the hope that horn trade becomes legalized, enabling them to generate an additional revenue stream from rhinos. And we know that two thirds of white rhinos would participate in horn trade if it became legalized. There is also a concern that if horn trade did become legalized, rhino owners might be incentivized to intensify how they manage their rhinos in ways that many conservationists might feel uncomfortable with. We know that only about a third of white rhino owners say that they would intensify should horn trade become legalized. So given this diversity and motivations and strategies, maybe this wouldn't be a predominant strategy, but it is certainly something we're grappling with. If horn trade doesn't become legalized, we might see growing disinvestment by these private landowners. If it does become legalized, we might see some of them tend towards intensification. And regardless of whether horn trade becomes legalized, we might see a trend towards intensification anyway, if smaller populations or more intensively managed populations are better protected or easier to protect from poaching or are more affordable to protect from poaching. So taken together, given this changing economic environment as a, as a result of poaching, we really need to grapple with the question of, well, how do we continue to incentivize rhino conservation that is inclusive of these diverse tenure types, um, but that also occurs in extensive systems if that is what we value. So I've done a little bit of work looking into the various incentives that people are putting on the table. Um, of course, some of these we know are existing incentives. These were the incentives that created this growth in, in private, private and community rhino custodianship in the past, we also know that these are now insufficient, given the growing costs of poaching. Then we've got these other incentives that are additional ways to generate revenues, either directly from rhinos, something like international horn trade if it was legal, or from managing uh, land areas for, for, for wildlife, things like soil carbon credits or possibly wildlife credits. And then we've got things like certification schemes. The government in South Africa is currently trying to develop a voluntary certification scheme for the wildlife ranching industry that might increase the value of existing ways to generate revenues from these properties. And then we've got the more typical donor funding avenues, taxation benefits in South Africa. If you're a privately protected area or a biodiversity agreement, you're eligible for some of these more conventional philanthropy, which can also include wealthy individuals that have rhino on their property and continue to pour money into conserving them. There's the imp impact bond. We know that already exists. There's one successful case of that in South Africa. That essentially is just fancy philanthropy at the end of the day. And then we've also got some wildlife credits like those, uh, for example, in Namibia that set up a centralized fund that rewards communities for rhino sightings. But again, that's actually government and donor funding at the end of the day. Then we can start to unpack, well, who might benefit from these kinds of incentives? For example, taxation benefits are just a tax deduction on another income source, so they really, it seems, are only beneficial to the wealthy, which has implications for inclusive rhino conservation. Things like carbon credits and perhaps a similar uh, mechanism for wildlife credits require a demonstration of additionality. So what are you going to now do that will increase carbon or wildlife, which suggests that they're only really available to, to new entrants into rhino conservation or those willing to expand their enterprises. So it doesn't really help re-equilibrate the cost-benefit ratio for those already in rhino conservation. And then we can start to think, well, if we value rhinos in extensive systems, well, what kind of incentives might incentivize 
extensive versus intensive management, and perhaps some do that better than others. And then taking a step back, we need to think, well, what kind of policy landscape enables these kinds of incentives? And I would argue, for example, in a South African case, that we're quite focused on the regulation to prevent intensification as opposed to what kind of incentives might incentivize extensivation, ex extensive um, rhino management ex as opposed to just regulating intensive. So, in summary, I think we can't ignore this growing role of private and to some extent communal rhino custodianship as a complement to rhino conservation in state parks. So if we want rhino conservation to be resilient, we really need to think about how we build the resilience of this role. And I think that requires us to think about adaptive policy that ensures the incentives for rhino conservation remain greater than the growing costs. And that also causes us to grapple with difficult questions around wild rhinos versus safe rhinos. Thanks very much. Thank you, Haley. You've used all of your time, but also a bit of a futures thinking in terms of rhino management. We appreciate it. Um, so next up, we've got Lindy talking about emotions in engaging complex problems. Lindy Borta. Good morning, everybody. Um, you'll forgive you my thick pack of old-fashioned speaker's notes because I've got a condenser, 88,000-word 88, thesis for you today into, into a 15-minute talk, and I'm going to try and do that very systematically. So for my talk to make sense to you, I'm going to ask you to think back to a period of about 10 years ago when rhino poaching began to increase dramatically in the greater Kruger landscape, because my story is very much situated in that time. Most of my data come from that period, notably 2013 onwards, when Kruger National Park's range of services, under new leadership, set out to paramilitarize and professionalize the anti-poaching response. Do you remember the atmosphere of that time? And I don't see many of my uniformed colleagues in the room. So if you weren't here, do you perhaps remember the mood captured by the media reporting of that time? So my story is a story about the stories we tell in organizations as we make sense of messy, complex problems, and in this case, rhino poaching. It's about why these stories matter and their effect on our ability to tackle complex problems in our organizations in the manner that experts and scholars call for. In 2015, I joined a networking event in Hootspreit, attended by conservation NGOs and private and state nature reserves. After presentations about topics like climate change and, and community development, focus shifted to the escalating problem of rhino poaching. I was struck by how conversations about rhino poaching differed from those about poverty in local communities, or climate change for that matter. Talking about poaching instantly altered the mood in, a, in the room, creating a sense of gravity, alarm, and vividness. After the meeting, I noticed how red-eyed, uniformed men got together in groups and shared whispered intelligence about the previous night's incursions and carcasses. I was intrigued. Why was rhino poaching such a hot issue? A palpable, imminent, abnormal crisis. Whilst the problem, the poverty problem, affecting millions of people outside the park, felt much cooler, abstract, distant, and normal. As an organizational scholar, I knew I was witnessing how people used symbols and words and emotions to construct 
a particular version of reality. And I wondered, how was the rhino poaching reality being constructed? And to what effect on those trying to stop poaching? This, inspired, uh, this broad question inspired a six-year uh, ethnographic qualitative longitudinal study, mostly focusing on the Kruger National Park, but included field work in the APNR and with other NGOs, um, including the Southern African Wildlife College. So I studied the management literature that describes how people constructed versions of reality and the tactics they employ to get others to accept that version of reality. For example, studies show how organizations deploy emotions and aesthetics to promote particular organizational goals. For example, airline companies demand certain looks, certain emotional displays and appearances from airline stewards. And this creates a reality that we perceive as one that is calm, sophisticated, and efficient. It's a reality we take for granted the moment you get onto an airplane, that atmosphere, it's just there. You don't think about the fact that it has been carefully constructed. So this literature I was in emphasized the strategic nature of how people construct reality for others with a linear link between their intentions and the outcomes, as, as we see it in the airline example I just gave. Since rhino poaching was surrounded by such a pulsating atmosphere, I paid attention to how senior managers deployed emotions to achieve particular objectives. But in contrast to what I read in the literature, I saw that the deliberate use of emotions also had a dark side. It had uncontrollable, unintended consequences that unfolded over a longer period of time. So my work was built around very specific ideas and very theoretical ideas around emotions, moods, and atmospheres. So emotions, moods, and atmospheres are changeable. For example, emotions can be created, altered, and maintained by those external to us. They are highly contagious. They have conscious and unconscious dimensions, and we take them for granted as simply being there, if we are even consciously aware of them. We rarely ask ourselves, where do our collective moods and emotions come from? What and whose purposes do they serve? If all of this sounds a bit abstract to you, think about how your own emotions are manipulated by advertising agencies, songwriters, filmmakers. These are the masters of the art at making us feel something towards a particular end. I learned that emotions fundamentally shape organizational life. They are unconscious forces that can blind us to the most obvious def deficiencies of our plans, but they can also inspire creative and innovative solutions. And we often forget that they are a very important influence on our motivations, our actions, and also on our moral judgments. Why was a new rhino reality needed? Do you remember a time when rangers wore plain green uniforms and law enforcement work was but one aspect of a multifaceted job? Do you remember a time when there were no nighttime curfews enforced inside protected areas and between protected areas? Do you remember a time when there was budget for anything else other than rhino poaching? From 2013 onwards, newly recruited leaders for Kruger's anti-poaching campaign had to give the contestable rhino poaching problem a stable meaning. They had to obtain legitimacy and support and resources for their chosen course of action, which was primarily a paramilitary response. This was no small challenge, as one, year senior, one senior manager put it. The biggest challenge was, in an organization focused on nature conservation and tourism, to create a sense of urgency about what you are trying to do. Those guys think in terms of drought cycles, the gestation period of an elephant. And here I arrive and I say, I need choppers. We need to do this now. We need more rangers. The whole system didn't want to digest it. 
It took a lot of my energy. Nothing was delivered on time. The soles of the ranger's boots were falling off. And you can go on and on. The park's unhurried organizational culture was well suited to preserve a timeless, idealized wilderness. But it was incompatible with the novel and disruptive demands of paramilitarization. Paramilitarization needed a new rhino reality in order to galvanize change and action. How did people do this? Leaders told stories that fostered a mood of shock, urgency, and crisis. Kruger was re routinely referred to as the eye of the storm. The fragile fortress, Rhino Armageddon, a place that was perpetually running out of time and running out of rhinos. Act now was an important mantra. Clear the park from the outside was another motto that focused attention on the park's external immoral enemies. The war on poaching was deeply moralized. In 2018, for example, the Sandpark CIO said that by plundering the species in National Park, they, poachers, are selling their souls to the devil. Paramilitary practices and artifacts were glamorized and poachers demonized. Rangers were called upon to fight a cosmic battle between good and evil. Christianity was the official religion of the, the response to curb wildlife crime. Interestingly enough, we don't see something similar when it comes to other crimes in South Africa. For example, rape, murder, and robbery. The new rhino reality both fanned and was constructed through powerful emotions. Fear, moral panic, anger, and outrage. This had desired effects. Desperate times justified desperate paramilitary measures. The new, reality, the new rhino reality inspired commitment, resources, and action towards the chosen course of action. It established rhino poaching as a national, regional, and international crisis. Rangers in the park were now warriors with a heavy moral responsibility to protect rhinos at all costs. The emotional climate in the whole greater Kruger helped to cement the belief that paramilitarization and its suite of compulsory solutions were indeed the only alternatives. Ranger work was seen as unconditionally virtuous, virtuous even though it was inherently violent. Stories and symbols transformed a complex social, political, and economic problem into a one-dimensional security threat that was only solvable through technology-intensive paramilitary action. This had unintended consequences. Focusing on the perilous now distracted the attention away from the longer-term drivers of the problem and the consequences of paramilitary activities outside the park in the buffer zone. The hurried atmosphere created in, inside organizations precluded opportunities for dialogue with other stakeholders and sectors through which alternative courses of action could have been designed. Occasionally, even rangers pointed out this problem. As one ranger lamented, we are supposed to be a learning organization, but we are not doing adaptive management here. We are not learning. We are losing out in ranger services. People lose sight. They work hard, but they forget the bigger picture. As the rhino war dragged on, personnel could not live up to the organizational myth of a battle being won in a sacred, fortified landscape by heroes working tirelessly at breakneck speed. This contradiction between the myth and their lived reality left them increasingly disappointed, hopeless, and bitter. As a frontline ranger said, you are the one getting shot at. You see poachers bleed out and you feel nothing. I told the clinical psychologist, I feel nothing. Day in, day out, we're in survival mode. Survival mode. We know from the literature that negative shared feeling states trigger individual and organizational defense mechanisms 
which hinders our ability to respond creatively to complex problems. If you feel like a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Management and complexity scholars tell us that to solve messy problems, we need to surface multiple view viewpoints, engage with a variety of actors, surface multiple interpretations to come up with bold and novel solutions. Yet, the emotions and the moods created around the rhino reality at the time made doing this very difficult. Decades of psychology literature tells us being in survival mode constrains our ability to maintain motivation and drive and to be open to novel ideas. What do we learn? Emotions are a vital charge when starting new projects to motivate, motivate people and garner support and resources. But they have a dark side if they're too relentless and intense. Leaders should work with trusted outsiders to take and assess the temperature of the organizational climate and mirror it back. Leaders should guard against overzealous and morally rigid definitions of problems and solutions. This can lead to an overcommitment to one course of action in a rapidly changing environment. We all should avoid demonizing external enemies whilst neglecting organizational problems within, such as leadership vacuums, lack of trust, corruption, and low morale. The literature shows that organizational culture and emotional climate, if positive and hopeful, can have a dramatic positive impact on how people stay engaged and, complex and, and, and tackle complex problems. So, of course, emotions must and can be managed, but with great care and special attention to unintended consequences. Gabriel and Griffiths tell us, organizations are emotional cauldrons where fantasies, desires, and passions lead a precarious coexistence with plans, calculations, and scientific thinking. I believe this is especially true for those of us working on messy problems in organizations in high-stakes settings. My last slide. And my, my parting shot to you. What kind of problems inspire our emotions and our passions? What kind of problems do we choose to construct as intolerable and urgent? Will we ever go to war for the problems affecting people outside our reserves, such as poverty, inequality, corruption, etc.? Considering that the problems in society and nature are intrinsically link linked, should we not tackle those problems with equal zeal, passion, and dedication? I thank everybody who shared their time and their stories with me during my PhD journey, and I thank you for letting me get into the cauldron with you. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy, for that very thought-provoking talk. You've taken all of your time, but people will chat to you during tea, I'm sure. Um, I think Lindy is giving us more credit than, than we actually deserve to think that we were well curated and constructed this narrative. <laughs> I think it kind of just emerged for self-preservation, really. But we can talk further. Um, I'd like you to, to introduce you to the next speaker, Alistair Nelson. Alistair's looking a little bit more into the beast of integrity management planning for rangers. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I didn't realize how incredibly well what I'm going to talk to you about flows from what Lindy has just described to us. I kind of have goosebumps both for the depth of what she went into, also because of the problem that we're trying to address. Um, so this work really fl is two years' work um, that has been done, led by uh, WWF, the CATA program, in conjunction with Sand Parks, um, and is now being implemented as, as a plan. Um, and I'd like to thank my sort of co-authors and people I've worked with on this, Kathy Dreyer, um, Joe Shaw from WWF South Africa, and, and Adam Armstrong. Um, so what I'm going to uh, talk to you, actually, before I get into the talk, I just want to give you some key concepts. When I talk about wildlife crime, I'm describing the whole value chain from poaching through trafficking to the end market. 
When I talk about poaching and trafficking, I separate them very distinctly because they are functionally different. They're typically carried out by different types of people. They typically fall under the remit of different agencies who have different mandates to address them. Um, a bit of context. Uh, SADC has revised its counter wildlife crime strategy recently, and part of that process, they did um, interviews with about 150 different people, um, experts, officials, 50, 60 government officials working in wildlife crime, and we found some key things that are really important to think about how we address wildlife crime. First of all, the centrality of corruption in wildlife crime, when we know that organized crime cannot exist without corruption. Second, that where we've seen transformative counter wildlife crime success, think Malawi, which used to be a center for ivory trafficking and is no longer, the key thing that has made uh, the difference there are these centralized intelligence and investigations units targeting the priority, doing intelligence analysis to, t to identify the priority criminal syndicates, targeting those organized crime syndicates to dismantle or disrupt them in some way or other and the corrupt facilitators. And we've seen that in Tanzania, in Zambia, in Malawi, a bit in Namibia, and to some extent it's starting to happen here now, very late. Um, they have specific structures, I'm not gonna get into that, to make these units work. We've also seen poaching declines halted in a number of pet protected areas in, in our region. Um, and what has set these apart has not been tactical brilliance. It's been a focus on leadership and staff motivation a focus on core HR processes that focus on how you select people, internal discipline, rules, regulations, motivation, and in some ways govern, internal governance, then local coordina coordination outside the protected areas with other authorities and focus on local governance as well, even where that's challenging. These are all corrupt places, police, court systems, local government. We see people focusing on the whole law enforcement chain, all the way through intelligence, investigations, prosecutions, even supporting local courts. And we see integrated approaches that also address human wildlife conflict, co um, human wildlife coexistence. Where we saw success, there were almost always, in fact, there were always partnerships. It doesn't mean where there are partnerships, there's always success. The corollary doesn't hold. Partnerships are costly, but there are specific partnerships, and partnerships are vital to success in addressing wildlife crime. And what came through strongly, which as Lindy has raised for us, is concerns of the militarization of protected area law enforcement. I'm going to speak to that slightly. Some background, this research we did was not an investigation. What we were looking for was to identify evidence-based approaches to mitigate and build resilience to corruption inside Kruger National Park. First phase we did was a literature review and we spoke to experts from around the world, so experts in public sector and behavior change corruption in Mexico, in Uganda, gender and corruption issues from Uganda, and uh, other people from South Africa, and we, and we looked at evidence-based approaches. We conducted interviews with managers and field rangers to understand the context in Kruger National Park and the problem more deeply, and then we co-developed a plan, and in January we started implementation of this plan, focusing specifically on ranger services in Kruger National Park. Um, the five approaches, so what the experts and literature review told us, if you want to, when you address a corruption, you normally take five approaches. You investigate and prosecute it. You expose it, think investigative journalism, transparency. You do organizational strengthening. Most of us will hate that. That means you sign more pieces of paper to get access to some, something. Auditors love it. Um, you, do, you build organizational culture and integrity, okay? So you look at the values of the organization, the stuff that Lindy was talking about right now, and how those align with the values of the people who work in that organization. And you focus on the individual, and you can use behavioral sciences here to understand more deeply the problem and why people are, are making these poor decisions, basically, to engage in a corrupt act. When you have a problem as complex and as deep as there is in Kruger National Park, this is no longer a bad apple problem. This is a bad barrel problem. We have an organizational problem, and we need to own up to that and admit it and address it. I say, I say we, I don't work for Sand Parks, but I've become very close to this organization. This is a social ecological session. You people probably know this very well, but as a, as a conservationist, a wildlife crime person, this was critical for me to understand. When we look at social ecological models, we need to think at different levels. We need to think at the level of the individual and, and, and our motivations and feelings. We need to think at the the level of the, the relationship. And here in Kruger, we think about teams. Um, we need to think of the, the level of the community and the values that that puts on us. And here, specifically, we're thinking about range of services in Kruger. And we need to think at the level of the society and the norms that that gives us. And here, let's think about um, 
uh, about um, South Africa as a whole. Obviously, we can't impact society, but we have to think about how it impacts us. And so if we have those five approaches and we want to address this complex problem of corruption, we need to be thinking at these three levels, and we need to really be trying to impact all of those across those approaches to have an impact on this problem. Okay. So our interviews here were conducted with um, ethics clearance from Wits University. We interviewed 27 managers, um, most of them within Sand Parks, but a few from outside, from the, the head of Kruger, all the way down across multiple departments, scientific services, um, uh, HR, um, um, uh, finance, and other people in, in conservation, including Ranger Services. We conducted, actually, we aimed for 36, but we ended up with 32 interviews with field rangers working across the park, um, basically six in the north, uh, sorry, 12 in the north, 12 in the middle, 12 in the south, that's 36. We ended up with 32 workable interviews, all done in local languages, all translated then for analysis. At a very high level, what we found is thinking at, at, at different scales. At a regional level, people told us that social and cultural norms are changing and they've changed quickly. And that around Kruger National Park, people seek prestige now through wealth and conspicuous consumerism. And this is especially driven by a patriarchal society where young men are not able to access jobs, they're not able to access land, and this plays a major role. Um, we see weak levels, weak governance, think of the pro four provinces around Kruger, Mpumalanga, Limpopo, Gaza, and Maputo province, all of them are subject to weak governance and high levels of criminality. As one, interviewer say, one interviewee said, it's like trying to create an island of lawfulness and a sea of unlawfulness. Within Kruger, there was a perception that there's corruption in many places in the organization. People spoke about tendering, they spoke about HR processes, they spoke about rhino poaching, they spoke about giving information for rhino poaching. Uh, there's a perception of impunity and a lack of consequences for corruption and, and unprofessional behavior. There was a perception that over time, people are able to get away with unprofessional behavior. They spoke sim simple things like littering and speeding, but all the way up to, to corruption um, and um, yeah. So at an individual level, uh, what was key is that there's an almost universal perception that there's a breakdown in trust among key staff in Kruger. And this is critical. You can't address a complex problem if there's no trust between people. And the levels of trust, the key things that came out was the field rangers don't trust the section rangers and the regional rangers above them, and, and there's no trust between that level and senior leadership and other departments within Kruger National Park. And you, you can't function in a system without trust. What was clear is that the shift in focus over the last 10 years brought on by the rhino poaching crisis, and which Lindy has so eloquently laid out for us how that was constructed, has played a major um, role and underpinned that breakdown in trust. What did the managers told us? 85% of them spoke about corruption in the broader system contributing strongly, creating these norms that corruption is acceptable. 85% again spoke about the lack of consequences for doing things wrong and how this had become a, a norm within, within Kruger that you could just get away with being unprofessional. 67% said that staff feel unsupported in Kruger now, but particularly the field rangers. 52% said that the social and cultural issues in the area and the problems are contributing to driving corruption, both outside but particularly for the, these men and largely with the focus on the men who work in ranger services in, this, in the patriarchal society that they come from. Speaking to the field rangers, 70% said that they feel like they get insufficient support and it's getting worse. One field ranger said, first I'll go with counseling because it's difficult to talk to people who are not okay, specifically talking about his section ranger. So you need to talk with people who are ready to talk. So I hope there are people who can help the field rangers. A plea. 86% characterized internal relationships as negative, not only with higher levels, but internally as well, because of the distrust brought on by internal corruption and not knowing who you can trust when you're out on patrol. 73% spoke of declining standards of management and leadership. Trust, one, some field rangers sorry, said trust is an operational requirement. The job needs values. And this is where we start to see our hope and the way out of this problem. One field ranger said we need to work together to achieve the common goals. So we need people who have good spirits, leaders who have a good spirit of leading in a better, more appropriate, honest way. Coming back to the, their perception of corruption again, the field rangers also felt that the pervasive corruption in the region makes it a social norm. Perceptions that internal corruption are pervasive. 97% that said, that, of course, that financial issues are the primary driver, but when pressed, 63% said that general social norms and values contribute to whether you choose to make that decision or not. It's up to the individual to choose. One said, we work long hours, but get little salary. 
corruption won't stop. Another said, we all have debt. We are all facing difficulties. It's up to you to choose. And 53% said we, they see the solutions as linked to values, personal choices, and job satisfaction. When we asked the field rangers about the possible solutions, one said, oh, sorry, 67%, two-thirds of them said, go to the field, talk to the rangers, hear their problems. You will not be able to fix all the issues. You will not tell them you will fix it all, but you can try. Do not give empty promises. So here's where we're starting to learn what we need to do. 40% said increased consequences for corruption. 47% um, focused more on morals, values, and discipline. And 40, so that's sort of organization and individual level, team level, focus on trust, leadership, and team cohesion. As one field ranger said, it's not about money, money, always money. We need motivation from our leaders, and that can reduce corruption. So we put together a plan based on that, basically. So I'm not going to go into this in any detail. Um, but the professionalization or uh, uh, the strengthening of the professionalization of ranger services and the support that people get. An, an action we call, strategic action we call ranger resilience, which addresses some of the core drivers of this. We get into financial management, debt management, mental health, uh, physical health, uh, the legal support that already is done. We're looking at the risk profiling that's done as well. Because the bad guy, the, the, the corrupt, the crime networks are profiling the field rangers and we need to oppose that. We get into uh, polygraph testing and, and a fair and transparent system and improving investigations and prosecutions and then supporting actions for how to address that. So in conclusion, really, what I want to say is that wildlife crime is best re reduced, what we've learned, by targeting and disrupting the priority organized crime networks, not by criminalizing poachers. Pro protected area law enforcement works better when it focuses on rule of law and supporting local governance. Protected area law enforcement and these wildlife crime units work better when they emphasize specific norms and values, for example, integrity and professionalism, and actively seek reward and shape these norms, values, and qualities in people. Okay. So this is all about organizational stuff is where we see it working. And the war on poaching and the warrior model of guarding is not delivering the outcomes needed, and it's time to rethink our approach to protected area law enforcement. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alistair. Um, we've got a little bit of time for Alistair, but not time in the session because we're running over. So I wonder if we could hold the questions for tea time. Thank you, Alistair, for saving me some time. Uh, I've been bad with managing the session, clearly. So next, I want to introduce you to Louise Swemmer. Louise is talking um, to us not about resource use this time, but about National Parks Week and the potential benefits. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Danny. So I made a concerted effort not to mention Mapani worms or thatch in my presentation today. I'm going to see how it goes. Um, and it's quite nice to actually have a clicker. The last time I presented here, it was for another meeting, and the laptop was down on the floor. And it was quite a big sort of group, and I actually had to press the buttons with my toe. I don't know if anyone else has ever done that, but it's not that easy. Um, and it turns out I have shaky toes. I don't actually have shaky hands, which is weird. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about Sand Parks Week. Um, for those of you that don't know what it is, I'm going to explain a little bit about it. But I think it's just one of those examples of one of the many different things that Sand Parks is trying to engage more positively with people um, as opposed to how things have been done in the past. Okay, so Sand Parks happens one week every year. Um, it's basically, it's a week where people can come in for free um, and drive around the park as a day visitor. It doesn't include overnight stays, um, but it's really about trying to facilitate access to the park for people that haven't always got the opportunity to access and for people that can't always afford the conservation fee. Um, and it's really about cultivating a culture of conservation, but instilling a sense of pride um, around heritage, biological heritage, as well as cultural heritage for South Africans. Um, so it's about creating a positive experience um, and then also creating exposure. So they started in 2007, um, 2008, and since then there's been literally thousands of people that have participated in Sand Parks Week. 
And I think um, in this last year, there was over 50,000 people in 2022. So it's a, lot of, it's a lot of free access. And it's really exciting. It's an amazing week to be part of. Um, and it really has some very positive impacts. But I think what the whole sort of point about it is, is that um, it hasn't always been the case, um, certainly in, in national parks in South Africa. And not everyone has had the privilege of being able to build connections with these amazing places. Um, while they've been growing up, many people's parents haven't built these connections. So um, these different opportunities are trying to enable people to connect positively with, um, with some of these national parks because we know that that's important for the sustainability of parks as well as for the well-being of people. Um, and there's a lot of different projects that do this. So I'm just going to talk about Sand Parks Week, but you know, there's lots of different things that are happening, and we've heard about some of them this morning, um, all with different aims and objectives. But I think the idea here is really it's about promoting access um, and opportunities for people to see what's happening on the inside. So what do we know about Sand Parks Week? already, we know that it's been increasing over time in terms of the number of participants. Um, and that's kind of about it. We monitor the number of people that come in every year, and we try and have more and more people come in in the following year. Um, but there's a whole lot that we actually don't know. So who are these visitors? Who are these people that are participating in Sandparks Week? Where do they come from? Are they regular? Do they come in, um, you know, have they entered into the park before? Um, how do people actually feel about the, about the initiative? Do they enjoy themselves while they're visiting? What are people's expectations of coming in for the day? What do they want to see? Um, and then, of course, what experiences do they have? And I think this is quite important because there's a number of different people that will be in the parks on these days. There's people that will come in for free, but then at the same time, there's people that would, would have been staying overnight. Um, and, of course, they don't qualify for free entry. So there's a number of different groups that are sort of participating and non-participating at the same time. Is our advertising working well? And how do our staff feel? I mean, it's pretty crazy out there. I don't know if anyone's really participated, but it's, there's a lot of people doing a lot of fun stuff, and there's staff running around like mad just trying to keep control of everything. Um, and is there anything that we actually need to do slightly differently? You must remember, if I know your name and you're walking out, I'm going to call you back in. I'm actually quite impressed that there actually are some people in the social session, and I'm amazed that Wayne is here. Wayne, you're doing the wrap-up. So that means that nobody's going to summarize from the other session, so well done. Good choice. Um, okay, so what did we do to, to try and address some of this? So we started off, I did some face-to-face -face interviews during Sand Parks Week um, at some of the gates. We then did some very last-minute online questionnaires as well. I've only got a response of 49, and I can talk a little bit more about how that happened. Um, and that was really to interview people that had been camping overnight or, or staying in the chalets overnight during Sandpox Week, so non-participants, but people that were here. And then we also did some, on, some email interviews with staff. So what did we learn so far? So it was quite interesting. So I did three days of interviews, face-to-face -face interviews, um, and there were 80 different towns represented on the people that we spoke to. That's a lot of different areas that participated. 78% um, uh, of those towns were what we would call local, so those are people that would be living in towns that are full within about 20 k's of our western boundary. And most of the people were from the two provinces that abut the western boundary of the park. Group size was quite variable, um, and also quite variable in terms of the history of visitation. So quite interesting that quite a small fraction of the people that we spoke to, it was, you know, only few, for very few of them, it was their first time to come into Kruger. Um, quite a few of them visit at least once a year, and then quite a few of them actually visit between two and seven times a year, which was quite interesting for us to learn. This was a really interesting group, a lovely group from a village near, Kaze, near um, Zanin. And why I wanted to show their pictures because um, one of their friends, there we go, he's um, 104 years old, and it was that week of his birthday, and apparently these guys come in all the time. So they drive all the way from Zanin. This was at Open Gate. I mean, that's like a two-and-a-half-hour drive. Um, we come every year during Sandparks Week, and we come other times as well. We're all pensioners. Last week we went in Palabora, so that was non, not during Sandparks Week. Today we're going in Open and out to I mean, that is a long drive. And these guys were having such fun, having a really wonderful time, and they made me take this photo just to show that he is actually 104. That's his ID book over there. 
So really lovely stories, being able to spend time and just talking to people. And we've heard quite a bit this morning about relationships and engaging and connecting. And I think that's really what it's all about. You know, and we've spoken about how we need to in, sort of reach out more with social media and TikTok and all the rest of it. And that's good. But um, it comes down to face to face, you know, when you're talking about building relationships. So that's where we've got to invest, invest resources in, in being able to do that more. Um, so most people knew that it was Sand Parks Week. Um, most people said that it was pretty well advertised, and most people hadn't participated in Sand Parks Week previously, which was quite interesting because for many, there was such a few number of people that were actually coming in for the first time. So we've come in before, but we paid the previous time. No, this is my first time. Others from our area have been in, but we haven't, and others said we always come in during this time. So there's quite a mixed bag in terms of people knowing about it and why they come in and most of the people heard about it over radio or TV. So this couple I remember really well. They were so excited um, to be there. This is the first time that we're coming in by ourselves. The previous times we came in with friends who drove, and today we're driving ourselves. And they were really, really looking forward to their day, their day in the park. They're from Lulukani, just near to Palabora. So this was also an interview at Palabora Gate. And you can see they're holding their permit. Um, so what are the main reasons that people said that they were coming to visit? To see animals, that was sort of expected. We thought that that was probably the case, and you can cluster most of this into that, into that theme over there. To see lions, lions are always a big one. Good for Sam, because that's job security for you. We do like lion. Um, but then this one, I think, was also really nice. So quite a few people said, we're here to meet people. We're actually not here for the animals. This is so exciting. We're here to meet people. We want to meet people from different areas. And... Um, and also spend some time meeting the staff and getting to know the staff. And these guys just said that they're just here to relax as a couple. Um, this guy was also super pumped about being there. He said, I've come to see and meet people. Today, I will, maybe I'll meet a friend from Sweden or Canada. So he had high hopes for the day. So I didn't see him on, on the exit, but um, I think he, he had big expectations about that. So this was a group of teachers. I'm not sure I would have been that excited to see my kids' teachers during the week, you know, um, visiting Kruger. But they said they're teachers and we've taken the day off to come and visit. And then this was another group who said, we're visiting with my brother, um, who we haven't seen since 2019. These guys were from Dwarslip Village. Um, and he said, we've, here, we've come here to bond for the day as a family. And why this group stood out for me was because the, 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 the son is actually studying veterinary science. So he's from Cottondale but he's studying it in Russia. And so they hadn't seen him with COVID and, and they had this whole family, there were three vehicles and they were coming to bond as a family for the day, which I thought was really nice that that's what they chose to do. And I'm here because I really enjoy it. I left my wife at home. She's working, she's working night shift, so she's resting and I'm a pensioner. So people were you know, sometimes coming in on their own or as bigger groups, it was quite a, quite a variation. So what were their favorite parts of the visit? Seeing animals once again. The swimming pools are really popular um, in the day visitors' picnic sites. And then to enjoy and experience nature, but then also seeing lots of people happy together, which is such a beautiful thing to take home from Sand Parks Week. So, you know, loved. My favorite part was seeing people that are all happy together. Okay. Um, and I think this was also quite important for us. And it's not, it's not an easy day for a, for a receptionist in Sand Parks, let me tell you. Um, I got the privilege of hanging out at reception for two days, and um, I realized why I'm a scientist and I don't work in reception, because that is not easy, but they're incredible. And um, one of the people actually said, you know, it was really incredible. Well, their favorite part was just being able to be exposed to the friendly staff who were so kind, even though it was flipping hot. And it, I remember that day, it really, it really was hot. So our staff are really a really important part of making all of this happen. And that can't happen without happy staff. And I think it links into some of the stuff um, that Alex was saying earlier, really, really important. So recommendations from participants, we brag about strategic adaptive management. This is really what it's all about. So is this actually working? What are people saying? What do we need to do differently? Um, it extends from a Monday to a Saturday, which means that a lot of people aren't able to come if they're working. Um, so there's some requests for it to be opened up on Saturdays and Sundays make it a little bit longer. Obviously, children can't always come in, but there are school programs. Um, advertise in advance. Some people heard about it quite late. Um, and then expand the day visitor areas. I think some of the day visitor areas in the south were really busy on those days, so um, that can sometimes prove a bit of a challenge. There might be opportunities around setting up some temporary areas, for example. 
Um, and then there were some foreigners that were very upset that they weren't allowed to come in for free. Okay, so what about the non-participating visitors? Those are the people that, are, that were staying in the park at the time but didn't get in for free. Um, so that was a, I'm just gonna show you a couple of the results from there. So this was their first question. I didn't want to kind of say that this is a questionnaire about Sand Parks Week. I just wanted to ask them very broadly. So on a scale of one to 10, how was your visit? We got an 8.2 on average, which I thought was pretty good. That was just a broad sort of question. And then overall, did you experience anything that you didn't enjoy or that impacted on your stay negatively? I specifically didn't mention Sand Parks Week because I just wanted to find out. Um, and actually, there were quite a lot of yeses, but I'm happy to say after scanning the data, nothing is because of Sand Parks Week as would have been expected. Um, so things like baboons at Skakuza opening the fridge, lack of petrol at Lower Sabi, where's Corley? She's not here. The bushes and all the grass around Pretoria's Corp hindered the sightings and decreased the amount of animals in that area. So luckily, nothing to do with Sand Parks Week, so we're good to go. Um, did you know before you arrived that your visit coincided with Sand Parks Week? Most people said they didn't know. Were you aware during your visit? Yes, I was. Um, would you consider booking an overnight visit um, during the same time if you know that Sand Parks Week is happening? Mostly said yes, um, but there were a couple of no's. So if we can get accommodation during that time, we'll certainly book again, even if it's during Sand Parks Week, getting accommodation is a major issue. This was one of the no's. Too busy in the park, we come here for peace and quiet. Um, and then it doesn't matter as long as we can get the opportunity to visit Kruger. So these are quite good to know because you know there's kind of like the odd rumor going around that overnight visitors find it very difficult or it's disturbing and you see the odd dramatic post on social media. So it's quite nice to kind of know that actually it's not such a big deal. And there's ways that we can manage around some of these things. Did the fact that your holiday coincided with Sandpox Week impact on your holiday experience? No. This would be one of the yeses. Too many vehicles and people not obeying Sandpox rules, which happens all through the year, actually. Um, and to us, it was just exciting to see that more people can explore the park and the wildlife. Okay, so some observations from staff. Um, we can just maybe read them together. I think I didn't want to sort of paraphrase these, but Sand Parks Week this year came with a variety of new daycare centers. This was quite interesting because there were lots of schools that came in, but we've got school programs where schools can come in for free anyway. So it just highlighted the fact to us that we need to actually make sure that the schools are aware that it's not just Sand Parks Week that they can come in for free. People enjoyed being in the park to see animals, specifically the big five, and how special it is to see a real elephant, even an impala. Unfortunately, not all got to see the lion, but it was the joy of being in the park in their best clothes, even only for a day, which was amazing. I thought that was a really nice take home sort of message. Sand Parks Week being in September brings out our cultural diversity. So it's awesome, it's in Heritage Month. Lots of people who came in were wearing traditional outfits and they had spent the week visiting different places in the area. So some had gone up to special cultural um, sites in the area and then come to spend a day in Kruger. Um, and, and some of the other guests felt quite honored to be able to see some of our cultural diversity at the same time. And our culture in all its colors is what stands out for me during Heritage Month. Okay, so it was really positive for the staff as well. And even our rangers, this was a ranger, um, our staff loved seeing the enthusiasm of new visitors. So the rangers got involved at some of the areas which I think is really, is really nice. So I'm nearly finished, I've got one more slide. I had to share this with you. I don't know if any of you know the Lataba Elephant Hall. This is that big, very expensive bronze elephant. Um, but it's not solid bronze. And um, if some of you know Kirsty Redman, she was, this was a little school group. I think there were about 15 kids and she was sort of looking and there was chaos, there was people everywhere. And she said she looked away for a second and she looked back and there were 10 children on the elephant like hanging from the tusks and there was one around the back and she got the fright of her life because I mean that's not it's not a solid bronze elephant so she had a huge panic um, but those are the sort of things that happen when you know there's a lot of people around so just to close up I think 2023 we're going to close some of the gaps just in terms of our understanding um, I think what's important to know is who's not coming so we've spoken to who is coming um, but there's obviously a lot of people that didn't come in um, do some longer qualitative interviews at some of the camps. I think the bottom line is that it's meaningful, it's working, um, it's meaningful internally with, among the staff as well as for the visitors. And um, there is some stuff that we're gonna have to put more 
uh, if we can use the term boots on the ground, to look at some of the um, challenges around littering and around, um, and around speeding and so on, because that certainly did come out from the interviews. But I think it's something that we can manage and we've got to kind of continue doing these sort of projects. It's not the silver bullet. There's lots of different other programs that do more deeper engagement, but it's certainly got a positive impact. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Louise. We're out of time, but thanks for that positive story. Put us all in a good mood. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker, Lachran Trail, who's going to talk about the diversion views around trophy hunting and some of the implications for policy. Thanks, Lachran. Okay, thanks. So, um, my name is here as first author, but uh, obviously it's a group effort. And the paper that was published out of this, that is now published, uh, a former student, Shia, I handed over to her during the pandemic to lead, and uh, she published this as first author. Uh, the paper is now published, which you can see, uh, which I'll go through at the end. So, uh, trophy hunting, uh, it's interesting to someone like me, I grew up in Zimbabwe. Um, Harari, somewhere around there. And from a young age, I knew I wanted to go into conservation. And I grew up knowing and understanding that conservation is many things. So there are classic protected areas, national parks, but also conservation. When I was growing up and when I left school, uh, I was inducted into conservation that happened on other forms of land management, so uh, campfires, so community-based conservation as well as quite a lot of land that was set aside as safari areas. And after I left school, I took a gap year uh, before going on to university and actually ended, uh, worked on a safari over here, a safari over, over here, Sujarira. Um, and I wasn't at all interested in hunting. Uh, I was interested in conservation and wildlife management, but it always stayed with me. Um, I then went over to Australia, uh, worked on magpie geese, a uh, population of magpie geese, and one component of that was Aboriginal harvest. And that's when I really became interested in harvest, and trophy hunting is just a form of harvest, recreational harvest. And also incorporated that into population models and understood trophy hunting from a population perspective and how it can be sustainable. And uh, I then spent time in the United Kingdom and worked on uh, quite complex population models looking at the demographic and gen genetic effects of trophy hunting, but on temperate uh, species. And um, so really had a quite in-depth under uh, understanding of trophy hunting. And came back to South Africa, and not long after I arrived in South Africa, uh, this happened. So this is the social media attention around the world's most famous lion, and then around about that time, Everyone in the world knew about Cecil the Lion, and that has actually changed everything. It's changed the amount of papers, scientific papers, that have come out, and also uh, substantially changed the debate, shifted the debate, and also uh, media attention around trophy hunting. And at that time, I wrote a little piece with uh, Norman, um, uh, trying to shift the debate around hunting itself and towards conservation of protected areas, I was quite surprised at the amount of attention we got around that. And so after that, I really followed this debate. Um, and there were some things that really stood out to me, and then I discussed all of this with the co-authors in this paper. Uh, one thing that influenced me some time ago was this paper uh, by Peter Lindsay, and how he talked about um, the debate is a bit of a red herring, and it, dis it distracts away from uh, the costs of conservation, so the costs of maintaining protected areas. <clears throat> uh, I was also interested in articles like this. This is a well-known article. I'll show this to students that I lecture to. Um, and over here, this is um, quite instructive. Uh, Goodwell is from Zimbabwe. He was a student in, in the United States when Cecil uh, Gate happened. And basically, he says, here, yeah, don't offer me condolences about Cecil, and this, are you willing to offer me condolences about the villagers killed? And so what I was aware of as an African conservationist and someone that had worked in the fields in ecology before going on studying those, that 
lions get killed all the time, as you know, through conflict, um, and they don't get the media attention that says the lion does. And also, people get killed through conflict, and they also don't get that media attention. I was also interested in, uh, here's an example of a very high-level debate in science and calls for bans, so outright bans. And I was interested in this, uh, this is all, this debate within science is led by, well, precipitated by an article led by Amy Dickman, uh, and then there were subsequent uh, responses to that, and this is one of them. And what I note, well, this was interesting to me, and that led me to develop this uh, survey. What is also interesting is that uh, Zimbabwean authors that worked within Campfire uh, were part of this debate, but they were buried away in an e-letter that hardly anyone noticed. But uh, quite high-profile authors got a platform in, in places like science. So I had some discussion with authors, and I ended up coming up with a survey that uh, we developed based on three questions, uh, which I've touched on. So what's the extent of support for uh, trophy hunting or lack of support? Do people support a blanket ban or not? And then what is the support, support for outside funding? And um, uh, outside funding is something that actually, at that point in time, I developed the survey as what I was really interested in, but now uh, it doesn't interest me as much because there's so many issues that come out of outside funding. It doesn't, it doesn't last, and there are always strings attached, <coughs> attached, especially with Western countries. And also, it, uh, we wanted to know if there was going to be any difference in African uh, versus non-African views. So uh, we sent out a survey, anonymous, fully anonymous, anonymized online survey uh, through Google Forms, a pilot study, and then sent it out through Google Forms. Uh, very simple, 12 questions only. Um, and uh, all authors uh, sent out the survey uh, through mail lists, uh, to all our email contacts, to all the organizations we knew, and we requested that everyone just circulated that further and attempted to be as global as we possibly could. There's some, there were some limitations which I'll go through in the end. As global as we possibly could, um, and we attempted to maintain an equal number of African v. non-African res respondents. So African will be Africa-based respondents. We made clear at the outset that it pertained to uh, trophy hunting of large game, um, so classic big game hunting, not small plains game hunting. And we also posted flyers in Johannesburg, Zimbabwe, where my family uh, was from, and then also the United Kingdom and Germany. And those flyers are QR codes that linked to the survey. So the first question is very simple. Look at scale. Uh, here's a screenshot of it. Do you support trophy hunting? Do not support all the way to support. Neutral would be around about there. And that was a compulsory question. In fact, all the questions are compulsory, and people choose one of those. Um, so look at scale one to five, and we ended up recoding that as one to three. So pull those two and pull those two over there. Uh, the next question, again, very simple binary response. Uh, and do you support a full bank ban on the imports of animal trophies from Africa to African nations, such as the United States or United Kingdom? Yes or no? Quite simple. And outside funding, if hunting is ultimately phased out, or if, they, uh, if trophy hunters are no longer sustainable, should affluent nations um, pay for the management of protected areas supported or partly supported by trophy hunting, yes or no? And of course, those questions are interesting, but the demographics related to that are the more interesting uh, insights that you can gain. So we asked respondent location, so basically Africa or outside of Africa, Europe, North America, South, Central America. We did have Oceania and then Asia. We didn't get many responses from these uh, regions as hard as we tried. I think one limitation is Google Forms uh, is not accessible in China. So through my, our contacts in China, we couldn't get any responses there. Uh, age, gender, so binary female, uh, male, and then non-binary, ethnic groups, according to UK uh, definition, educational attain attainment and proximity to conservation. So whether the respondents work within conservation or not, very broadly. Uh, we got a lot of responses, so that many responses, 5721. Uh, Non-binary non gender was a very small sample, so we removed those, so we came up ultimately with 5699 responses. And more or less, 
equal Africa-based versus non-Africa-based respondents. Um, and then some just descriptive information. So quite surprisingly, a majority of the respondents actually supported trophy hunting. Um, but that's given the data. It doesn't mean as much as when we explore what's going on within those data. Uh, over here, uh, he, these are just descriptive statistics. 78% of respondents opposed an import ban. And you can actually start to see a pattern starting to emerge. So in this sample over here, people from Europe, a majority supported an import ban, but not the same from other regions. And uh, outside funding, what do uh, people think? Do they support outside funding? We didn't expect this. Actually, majority of people supported that. Um, and actually, quite a lot of people from Africa based. So uh, then actually get into what's really going on within, within the data. We ran a multinomial logistic regression for this is the response's trophy hunting view Likert scale. Uh, we went through a model selection process, and over here are displayed the coefficient values from that logistic multinomial logistic regression, where the categories were uh, support, uh, neutral, or don't support. So the baseline there would be don't support. And over here are the different parameters, so uh, the main effects and then the interactions. So for example, over here, conservation background, yes. So the baseline there will be people without a conservation background. So people with a conservation background, relatively more likely to support hunting. Uh, gender male, uh, they came out uh, right across the data, uh, more likely to support trophy hunting than gender female. Interestingly, when we explored the Africa-based data uh, across ethnicity and gender and age group, there was much more convergence as opposed to Europe, for example, where there's really quite distinct differences between uh, age groups and uh, gender. And also of interest, location Europe and rest of the world over here, significantly less supportive of trophy hunting, respondents based in Europe. Uh, and rest of the world, we pulled rest of the world, not North America, so North Americans converged in support of trophy hunting, along with people based in Africa. And here are the interactions, quite complicated to explain, but basically you'll see location, 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 location over here comes up. Out of all the possible interactions, location is significant, significant, significant. And for import ban, just a binary logistic, logistic regression, and again the coefficients, so positive, negative. So people with a conservation background, less likely to support an import ban. People from Europe significantly, respondents from Europe significantly likely to support an import ban where that baseline is Africa. So the baseline there is Africa, so that's relative to people based in Africa. And the, con the baseline there is conservation background, no. So con people with a conservation background, um, less likely to support an import ban. And then the interactions, interaction terms are quite difficult to explain. But again, location, location, location came out with all the significant interactions. It's really important. And again, for outside funding, not what we'd really expect. People with a back conservation background were more supportive of outside funding should uh, trophy hunting not be sustainable or no longer sustainable. Um, and gender group male, more supportive. People, respondents from South, um, uh, sorry, North America, not at all uh, supportive of outside funding, maybe because uh, we would expect that funding comes from North America. So, um, the main findings, uh, so I guess the caveat, of course, is there are issues with the survey. It's not fully random. It's not uh, geographically or socioeconomically uh, random. Uh, we targeted Anglophone countries across Africa, so English-speaking countries, and most importantly, uh, we excluded by mere fact that this was an online survey, we ended up excluding uh, the poor communities. Uh, the rural communities across southern Africa may not have reliable internet access. So there are many caveats around this, but it hasn't been done before, and it did provide some interesting insight. As you'd expect, there's divergent views around this. It's very nuanced. Respondent location mattered a lot. It was the most important factor. Um, and uh, proximity to, con uh, to trophy hunting mattered. So people within Africa who were affiliated with conservation were far more supportive of trophy hunting, so proximity mattered. People far away from the practice outside of Africa, less supportive. Policy, what does it mean? It means location bias may exist, uh, not really accounted for, 
And with the development of policy, we should encourage ge geographic diversity or democratization of conservation, I call it. So uh, conservation or policy would need to be representative of the people that are affected by that, um, any form of policy. This is a figure that came out from the same paper, and this is just basically primary authorship on all papers, I think from 1974, published on trophy hunting explicitly in Africa, and the primary, primary affiliation of authors. And I'm actually surprised there's so few in Southern Africa, but you can see the regions where the pri the, most of the authors come from, and this is their contribution to the trophy hunting debate. So it is somewhat skewed towards those regions, and that bias has not been accounted for. So further research, uh, media framing is important. In the United Kingdom, a, pa a paper has been published recently looking at how trophy hunting the debate is uh, framed by the media. And uh, the broadsheets actually say that uh, either it's negative framing or it's complicated. Um, the tabloids almost always negative. In Southern Africa, the news media actually uh, um, frames trophy hunting in a very different way. So complicated or positive, and there's uh, different aspects towards that. So that's not really been addressed. And uh, views within Africa, so further views right across Africa uh, on this debate. So differences between urban groups, rural groups, um, that hasn't been explored. Uh, poor people, l less poor people, and so on. That hasn't been fully explored. OK, uh, that's the paper, if you'd like to read it. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Lachran. Lachran, you've run out of time, but we headed for tea in all, right about the time where we should be coming back. So I think if you could do a quick tea, remember after tea, which is probably right now, there's a photograph taking place outside, a group photograph. Uh, I just wanted to quickly get everybody to, to clap for all the speakers in the session. It was a great session, and, and I want to thank everybody in the session for not just for their talks and for great talks, but also for their sort of passion for this, these landscapes. So thank you.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we just settle down, please, so we can start? All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, for those that are joining us from the other group, you're also welcome here. Um, and then just for introduction, those I've not interacted with before or we haven't met since the conference, uh, I'm Tlou Masahela, I'm with the Scientific Services team and I'll be taking you through this session uh, with the different speakers. And then uh, first up we have uh, Sam, uh, who's going to be talking to us about going beyond sustainability, transformation, sustainable use and welfare. Sam, over to you. Are we good? All right, thanks, thanks, Tlo, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's been wonderful this morning to listen to some very challenging challenges that South Africa has got, and most of you are probably very much aware that certainly in the last 20 odd years, South Africa has been transforming for lots of reasons, um, and certainly the world of industry or biodiversity is not isolated from that particular a particular aspect, um, uh, and it's just as one would actually have noticed in the most recent policy development stuff in South Africa on a biodiversity white paper and sustainable use, um, that is very much part of the forefront. Why is that the case? How do I push this button? Aha. There's a good reason why that is the case, because it's the links between human well-being and nature well-being are very strong. Yes, most of us tend to think about it as this white paper here. Yeah. Think about it as some sort of supply chain, you know, biodiversity pulling right through to services that people use, and that is what actually gives us good outcome. But there's quite a lot of feedbacks, and we had wonderful introductions this morning on things like some of the feedbacks around social aspects, so some of the corruption elements that Alistair has talked a little bit about and what those consequences um, might actually be. So certainly, how do we transform from these kind of risks, corruption and organized crime, even in the wildlife industry? And you can see why it's important, because it's part of this bigger particular system that's sitting out there. So what does transformation mean? It's some other complete chains. We don't like chains. <laughs> okay. Into something that is hopefully better than whatever it was before. And one of our challenges is, is this change supposed to be gradual? Or is it change that's supposed to be very quick? I'm taking some direction which I'll just change fast in a particular completely different direction. And why is this important? Because the social history of South Africa, one of fairly big social injustice, has left probably to a country or left a country that has got some of the highest levels of inequality in the society that we exist. And this is not just in how we live and all the other sort of things. There's a range of things that are also linked to our biodiversity values and biodiversity aspects. Now, what does inequality actually mean? You know, there are quite a lot of different viewpoints that people will have about this. But it is really about being equal in status in the world. Or let me, let me say the outcome of corruption he does. Um, it's about those three things, status, rights, and opportunities. And very typically in the world of space, now so there's actually four, three elements in inequality or equality considerations. It's the income that you have, it's the ownership that you have in society, and there's a third one, power, which we will talk shortly a bit about. I'm gonna focus just on the first two for now. The income, just like this is like, <laughs> you know, it's like an athletic tournament, you're passing on the baton here. <laughs> um, if you focus now just on two elements, wildlife income and wildlife tenure, they tend to be linked, you know, because yes, you got to have some land to have some wildlife on, etc. And this is largely embedded in previously advantaged groups. I think Haley's talk earlier this morning has highlighted some of those things of private industry that's got very large fractions of, of rhinos, for example, in South Africa. 
So the government has actually initiated a major program of transforming the wildlife economy. And the process is, we go around, I've gone to probably about 100 properties over a six year period, and we look at whether the properties are suitable, and we donate wildlife to local communities, and then we also do private loans to previously disadvantaged owners now. This is symptomatic. We are trying to make everybody equal, even though half of us may not even have the slightest interest in becoming a wildlife farmer. So this is part, I think, one of the particular problems. But what about the third element? And that's what I want to focus on a little bit. What about the inequality of power? Uh, and what you see on the slide here is uh, the outcomes of a study recently published that looked at the values of elephants. And they sent lots of methods all across the globe and got incredible input uh, of 90 values that's sitting out there. And they tend to range from uh, intrinsic to moral values, etc. I've picked the, third, the middle one, but there's actually a range of other gradients that's sitting out there. But the real important thing is this incredible variability in the values that people have got. One can imagine that the local person that's living next to the park with just that an elephant coming through, thrashing its crops, will have lots of values that are sitting in this instrumental space, food, medicinal, all these sort of things. Way more important for that person in that immediate time and space, there may be also some good spiritual values, for example. Now imagine what the value focus will be of people that are not living close to elephants. Somebody in New York, or somebody in Cape Town. There's a few of you from Cape Town out here. That's likely to be more focused on the moral side of the values of things like this. So do you think it's fair that all these values should be equal? Is it? No. Because we're all not equal. Some stakeholders are more equal than others. Okay. And this has been one of our challenges that we're really struggling in this particular space. And there are some, some useful guidance that we were thinking a little bit about. And one of them is if you think I think it was already addressed some of the cases. There are people that are experiencing significantly bigger impacts of an elephant than other people. Okay, that example I've given you of somebody living next to the park or somebody living in Cape Town. These different experiences. Elephants impact those people differently. But people also have interests. So currently, if you look at this sort of little dichotomy out here, people with experiencing a high impact that has got a high interest should have quite a lot of say in what happens. Currently, the people that say the most are sitting in this box. They've got lots of interest, but there's very little impact of elephants on them. And, and why this is important to start realizing, it's because it tells a lot about you how you should interact or how people should participate in decision making. Okay? And we're implying that equality in power is actually equitability in decision making. The people that are principally affected should have say them, have the most say, and they should be on top of Einstein's layer of citizen particip participation, really big in citizen empower empowerment and so forth. Now this doesn't mean I'm writing a plan and I'm sending it to the local community and asking them what you think. It actually means I go to the local community with no plan and I design things together and I start thinking a bit about how to do those sort of things. So, we've been part of a, of an, I, I want to illustrate an example for you if you do not consider this, uh, this equitability requirement. We've been part of a, a, a development of a national elephant strategy, we've actually called it a heritage strategy, uh, and we've spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people, lots of public meetings, including lots and lots of local people, we went there with a blank page and asked people what values do they have on elephants and about 40 odd values came out. Don't look at the detail, I just want you to notice the bars. Okay. When we didn't consider the relative importance of a stakeholder being affected, the primary statement is a better understanding and respect for the existence of elephants. Okay. Through political will, and yes, responsive legislation and local decision making. This was very elephant focused, very about saving the elephant element focused. When we applied that little matrix that I showed you a bit earlier, that little dichotomy, 
and we weighted the values based on people that are significantly impacted on. A big change happened. All of a sudden, elephants are seen within a systems focus, not an elephant on its own, and how people can have access to those values, but still have good responsive governance and can be part of adaptive decision making. Now, if I was writing the national elephant strategy based on not considering these relative important weights, I would have been focusing on this one on the left, whereas in fact, that is actually pro probably what is more real that's sitting out there. So why is this important? Why is this risk particularly important? Um, because some of you are aware that South Africa has been going through a, a policy revision process around biodiversity conservation, and it started off way back in 2018 when there was a particular parliamentary colloquium on lions and the high-level panel process has happened. There was a draft policy. The draft policy, I think, originally had something like 8,000 submissions on that draft policy. The high-level panel had a lot of, of information uh, from, through various public meetings, but they also had 70-odd sub public submissions, mostly from foreign people. And that resulted in a draft policy and a white paper which defined sustainable use up there. It's got great elements about being ecologically and socially and economically sustainable, don't contribute to long-term declines, don't disrupt ecological integrity, you know, benefits to people, all the things in our, in our constitution, and then bang, there's something special for animals. Okay? And it's something special about animal well-being, and in fact, very strongly linked to animal rights cases. And this happened because all the comments and all the values that people were seeing out there were considered equal. Okay? So this is a really interesting thing. So is this useful, having this sort of discrimination? I mean, whereas, uh, William is not in the meeting here, but he would be offended that they're discriminating against plants. You know, there's a special something for animals, but not for plants. <laughs> um, and, and when you focus on that, there are some additional challenges that I want to highlight. So yes, the concept of welfare has, got, has evolved quite a bit, and it largely sits around this concept of five freedoms, five domains, as good food, good environment, healthy, good behavior, and the animal is not going crazy. Okay? And useful for companion animals, little cats and dog people in the room, wasn't so useful for domesticated animals. It was adapted to a life worth living. And we said, okay, now what happens if I am now in a nature space? Who are you are lion people? Who are elephant people? Okay. If you have to manage the welfare there now, what are you going to do? Okay. If I were using those criteria, at this picture as it is, the welfare of the little elephant is seriously buggered. If I intervene to deal with his health, with the welfare of the lion is seriously buggered. Okay. And I think this is one of our challenges. So we had to develop some other ideas. Uh, and, and one can think a little bit about that in a situation like that picture before, animals evolved ways to cope with stresses. And across all spectrums of those five domains or everything else, that evolutionary process is there. And you may simply argue, you know what, I should just provide opportunity for animals to actually play out their coping strategies. And this is largely what happens in large pro pro uh, protected areas. How the hell do you put these different categories into a policy? You know, somebody has now to decide, when am I here, when am I there, when am I in the wild space? So one of the alternative ways is to think a little bit about the duty of care concept. It's not a new concept. It's been around in some of the environmental stuff. And I know recently at the bottom there has been wrapping me on my fingers for not knowing that. Um, but there are some, some aspects like that that are not necessarily built well into our, into our wildlife policies. But one of the suggestions is think about that because it is really about minimizing reasonable or, or thinking about how you deal with harm, with, especially when harm is about, is about to happen. So that has dealt with one element of, of that particular policy. Let's go back to sustainability, and I think there was some good discussions earlier on also about it may actually not just be about maintaining what we've got. we actually got to do things better. We've got to increase things substantially. And yes, Lindy was talking about survival mode. 
So this is where we are set, this things that really create some real big troubles for us. Many of us are familiar with sustainability and resilience. Lots of talks happened in this conference around that. But it's actually about game on. It's going better than what we want to be. It's about enhancing both nature and people. And we have introduced this concept with some stuff with Danny and them, actually to some of the policy development ideas. And in the last version that I saw of the revised policy, that little offending, discriminating fifth bit has changed, and it now captures an insurer duty of care to all biodiversity. You know, so where's my termite friends? You can be happy now. Your termite's also good. Um, and it's about thriving people and nature. So I want to leave you with this message. Transformation, I think, is very real for us in South Africa. And in the, in the wildlife space, it is also very real. It's about how we actually reduce that inequality in status, rights, and opportunities. Um, it's got to happen through equitable decision-making, not equal decision-making. Equitable. People that are principally affected should be influenced. Um, and I think that particular aspect, if we get it right, and there's been lots of people that are talking about that, okay, we might just be thriving together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, so you can catch uh, Sam during lunch uh, for some chat. Um, so we just have a slight swap um, on the presentation schedule. Marissa is not here, but then Sam will just come back to present on her behalf. So we'll now go over to uh, Tele. She's just getting kitted, and then she'll, talk, uh, she'll take us through um, her talk, the, the adaptive uh, systemic um, approach. Thank you, Sam. Hello everyone, it's really great to be here. I think I was at the second or third conference as part of the Rivers um, Research Program, so that's been quite a journey. Now, when I sent in an abstract, this seemed like, if quite long, a reasonable description of what I wanted to say. Um, we've developed this adaptive systemic approach and it adds things into strategic adaptive management as, the par as Sand Parks has practiced it, looking specifically at social learning, fair knowing and participatory governance. But sitting listening today, I've somewhat changed what I think I'm actually saying. What I think I'm actually saying is how, because we have listened over the past days to the idea of messy contexts, the things that are complex and collide and are difficult. We've listened to stories of contestation and the relationship of contestation to emotions. And we also realize that there are outcomes that are difficult to measure and are very often themselves complex. And yet we have to act. And we have to act as researchers and conservationists, and we have to act in our own complex contexts. So what I'm going to offer today is some ideas of practicing the how as a researcher interested in the complex space of natural resource problems. So this is um, a diagram of strategic adaptive management as conceived by those founding fathers that Danny presented to us in the first um, session, um, Harry Biggs and, and Kevin Rogers. And in a very simple way, you plan, you act on those plans, you monitor the outcomes of what you're doing, and if you're not going in the direction you want to, you adapt the plan. Now, one of the big breakthroughs that Kevin offered was this notion of shifting adaptive management into recognizing you can't manage adaptively if you haven't planned adaptively. And he worked to create these adaptive planning process workshops and processes that brought people into the planning that would enable adaptive management with the idea that it would be participatory with as many stakeholders as possible. And those of you in the audience who are social scientists will also recognize the um, argument about whether we should be talking about stakeholders, which 
embodies the idea of holding a stake in something which in itself is intrinsically a power relationship or whether we should simply to be talking about actors. I'm going to use the word stakeholders because it's quite common in, in our kind of community of practice. And here we go through the process of recognizing that we have a common future, what might the vision of that future be, so going back to some of the futures work we've listened to, taking account of both values and context in various ways, and creating a plan that will let you go forward. Even more than that, and this was some of the um, work that Harry brought into Sand Parks, which was recognizing that not only do you need adaptive planning and adaptive management, that needs to happen in a context of governance that it recognizes the advantage of adaptation and adaptive implementation. But even more than that, or not even more than, but alongside of that, ways of monitoring and evaluation. And I'm going to come back to the notion of value creation in a bit. So Dirk Rue and some of the folk in this room, or maybe in the next room, have written about looking critically at strategic adaptive management in, the, in relation to organizational learning. And I was really interested um, to listen to the quote today that said, we're supposed to be a learning organization, but we're not learning. And I wonder about the challenge of what it means to be a learning organization. So what I've been doing for the last three years is um, part of and leading a large program through the African Research Universities Alliance, the Water Center of Excellence. And we're working across Senegal, Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and South Africa. And we decided that we would be working on natural resource problems and look, seeking to apply the thinking that is inherent in strategic adaptive management towards what we call social ecological justice. So adding or combining that complex social ecological systems thinking of Ostrom and the environmental justice that we heard about into social ecological justice. Now that would seem a tall order in a project that was three years long and ran through COVID, sustained massive project funding cuts and then reinstatement with natural scientists for whom many of these ideas were really new. And so that's why I'm raising the question, how? How do we actually start to work like this? That's the end of the journey. This is the idea that we've come to at the end of three years' work, which is to say that in any complex system, you are bound by a process where you are open to or alert to these adaptive processes. So the diagram of the nested adaptive processes, you are alert to and you recognize that's where you're functioning. You recognize that in any complex system, you have to bound what you're doing, but that bounding process is porous. And so you do have to focus, but you have to be alert to context. I leave the adaptive planning process as a distinct process because I've run it probably 30 times, and I have a deep trust that it is a robust and effective way of bringing people into a space that shifts the space towards a greater equity in terms of power and a greater opportunity for knowledge sharing and acts as a kickstart to a variety of stakeholders having a greater potential to actually work together. And having kick-started that in this common space, and there's a lot of um, our work indicates that the way you facilitate those processes is as important or perhaps more important than the process itself. So there are principles because the way you facilitate embodies the values that you are trying to experience in that process. And then the process itself becomes 
a mosaic, it becomes in itself quite messy because you're working with multiple stakeholders, you are engaging with how they might conceive of strategic adaptive management and shift towards it. You are considering how to develop participatory governance. We do not generally have participatory governance, and it's come up over and over again as some kind of golden standard. It, in my experience, I've never actually seen effective on the ground participatory governance. And so working towards it and people recognizing why and how you might want to is important. And then finally, co-creating new knowledge. We listen to a lot of science and social science here. How do we infuse these complex processes with new knowledge? How do we use them to create new knowledge? So transdisciplinarity is one of my kind of guiding ways of working where we say that transdisciplinarity, oh sorry, is in itself contextual because it takes account of your complex context. It understands that you're working in messy problems, which invo involves both the people responsible with authority for the problem and those experiencing the problem. And you're bringing these multiple knowledges or experiences as a catalyst. And those multiple knowledges are embedded in everyone. They are not the preserve of the researchers who come in to tell people things. You've seen this before. We're talking about complex social ecological systems and what we did was be quite careful that the actual practical processes were sort of conceptually and theoretically based out of some of the outcomes we've seen in research over the last decades. And again, transformative social learning, this idea that transformation is driven by both experience and understanding, that it's not possible to learn if you have not also experienced and you can't, and the process of experiencing is part of a learning process, and this is some of Ray Eisen's thinking. One of the new ideas, perhaps, is this idea of epistemic justice, if you're anything like me and discovered epistemology quite late in your career, or perhaps you haven't discovered it yet. It's about the way you know, and so fairness in the way you know. Now, if you are bringing multiple stakeholders together, the way in which they know and the way in which they are able to express what they know is profoundly different especially if they are both culturally and in language different from other people. And in Africa, very often, the communities that we've been talking about speak in um, the, a different language and are not used to perhaps speaking authoritatively into formal governance contexts where there is an inherent power differential. And so how do you open up opportunities for people to be able to speak? And so for us, epistemic justice, and this comes in the manner of facilitating and the opportunities before something like an adaptive planning process, is to ensure that people experience being respect, respected, and we found that we got, we got good evidence that the facilitation could achieve that. But people being able to come into that space with the vocabulary, understanding, and confidence to participate has been more difficult to effect. And that has led us to this development of a participatory governance capabilities pathway, starting with co-knowing, what do we know in common, what can we learn from each other, into learning to listen and speak, and finally, planning, influencing, and deciding. At the end of a six-year project where we were intensively working with local communities, we only nudged co-speaking and co-listening as an effective um, catchment-wide set of real capabilities. So, sorry, what are we going to do? What have we done in terms of this big African project? Well, remarkably, there are six teams of African researchers who have said, yes, we'd like to work like this. And considering the fact that it's actually really difficult to work like that, that's really interesting. We have six sets of stakeholders in complex catchments engaged and willing to continue being engaged. 
And we have this process of value creation monitoring where we've been able to monitor processes along the way that track what value has been created for different stakeholders as we've progressed. So I think it's fair to say there is some evidence that it is actually possible to work like this. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Taylor. Uh, we've got about two minutes for questions, so maybe I'll take one question. Any questions from the floor? Comments? Okay. So thanks for the great talk, Tally. Tally, I wonder, in terms of society, do we value a little bit uh, experiential learning more than we do reflective learning. And so we sort of end up wanting to have more experience, value more experience, get more qualifications, and as, as a society, we seem to be sort of pulling through this like more and more qualifications experience. If I just look at our, our structures, our organizations, mm -hmm. we're putting a lot of value on qualifications and not so much in terms of how you learn, organizational learning, how do you learn from the experience in real time and build your, your capacity internally? I, I think that's, um, I'm, I think I'm using the word experience differently from a suite of, of qualifications. You're talking about all of that engaged practice that has enabled you in the context to act with more confidence. So that's the way in which I understand experience rather than a set of qualifications. So I really agree with you. And to embed respect for different ways of knowing is hard. Thanks. Thank you very much, Telly. And then now we are going to move back to Sam. All right, so as Sam gets ready, uh, on behalf of Marisa, I'll just introduce the topic that you'll be talking about, which is about bridging science, management, and opinion. Okay, uh, hello again. I'm not Marisa, as you can see. <laughs> um, but I did, uh, I have the task of uh, reducing what was originally a field trip for six hours on Friday morning after the conference to 10 minute reflection. So, <laughs> um, but I think that we, we can use this qu quickly to, to at least share some of the challenges, uh, which I think some of the things that Alex has highlighted earlier this morning uh, can realize. And there are lots of aspects that you've got to think a little bit, and we're going to use the elephant management uh, framework and, and the greater Limpopo transfrontier area to, f to reflect on that. Okay, let's first clutch a bridging scale. Let's find ourselves first. Um, yes, we are in this northeastern bit of South Africa, and that little purple bit there, that's actually the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area. And for some other reason, the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park doesn't include that little bit at the top there, so it's a subset. The key feature, though, is there are three countries that are signed up to this particular one. What are the elephant contexts in these three countries? They're very different. Mozambique has experienced a decline, the fewest number of elephants, but the elephants are pretty much widespread and they, are, and they have got some fragmented places. Zimbabwe has experienced a stabilizing elephant population. It's largely associated with large protected areas. And then in South Africa, we've got a very increasing elephant population, but it's broken up into two, a whole bunch of them sitting here in Kruger, and then a whole bunch, about 89 other little places. That's the context out there. The difficulty is none of these three countries has got each their own elephants. These elephants don't care about passports or COVID tests or anything like this. This is a recent paper that actually came out about three or four days ago from Michelle Henley and them, it just highlighted all the collared elephants that was collared in and around Kruger, and those little ones there are cows, and you can see they go and visit Mozambique quite a bit. Some of them go down to the beach and have a swim. 
and those are the bulls. So we've got this incredible movement that's sitting around here, um, and none of those elephants are any of the country's specific elephants. So how do you manage in this particular space? So one of the other breaches we have to see, maybe these are the breach, is one of the national policy breaches. So I'm not going to read those things at the top there. You can go pick them out if you like. But the focus is very different in the three countries. Mozambique are looking for very elephant-focused, want to reduce conflict with people, but there must be some net benefit for local people. In those policies, Zimbabwe, very elephant-focused, even though they've got a lot of elephants, very concerned about ecological impacts, and you've got to control numbers, reduce conflict, benefit for people. In South Africa, we are associated with some concerns about what elephants might make to people. Largely, we haven't got a lot of things, just that's quick. Um, and then you end up with kind of different kind of challenges sitting out here from numerical focuses in two countries and very spatial focuses in another country. Um, when I go to the structural level, there's lots of governance structures happening across the GLTFCA, but then I've also got within particular areas a range of factors, strategic development frameworks, right down to the kind of people we're communicating. The elephant strategy for TFCA try and address all those particular concerns uh, that's sitting around there, and it's got several pillars. The bottom pillar are the important ones. Basically, given all those differences that we see, the only thing that the national, a, a TFCA elephant strategy can breach is to coordinate and facilitate. The breakdowns come in ideology. Very often, we have got particularly exclusively westernized approach. I think there were some points addressed this, um, so let me go back a bit earlier, uh, about what those consequences might be, and it's all about saving elephants. When I go into the other side where it's about benefiting from people, often it's about the opinion on how elephants have got effects on people or on the ecosystems. So for example, in one aspect, we think there are too many elephants, let's cull them, in another aspect, we say it's not about how many elephants you've got, we actually should be managing those particular landscapes. Across the, the, the TFCA, the two big populations are actually both showing signs, as, signs of actually uh, reducing in population growth rate, so they're busy stabilizing. The second thing that is really important, we don't have evidence that suggests there's a specific link to how many elephants you've got and what elephant impacts you have. It is because elephant impacts is at the local scale, and elephants perceive things very differently across a particular local state. Thanks, Samantha. Reality is, evidence suggests to us, I, it's not about how, we, how many elephants I've got, it's about where they are, who they are, what they're doing, etc., etc. I think you've got this wrong. This is a 10-minute presentation, not a 5-1. Anyway, I'm going to take a couple of lenient points seeing that I'm up here now. What we really want to finish off with for you is that we typically move here between those four pillars, policy, public, management, and science. The ideologies is what's influencing policy a lot, and that's where the things happen. Opinions is what influence people in, uh, in the public space. So, for example, you know, Twitter and all these other sort of things is really... And yes, and then there's some lobbying, public to the policy, and policy uh, is basically putting regulations on top of you. What happens in this space? This is the evidence space, okay? And on the science side, we tend to be embedded in our processes, in our normal scientific process, experiential, experimental, comparative. When I go to the manager, I plan, I get the resources, and I implement, okay? I've got these two confused in front here, I must tell you. That. But they're busy bridging some stuff here. <laughs> okay. um, but apparently I've now said that I've got some more five minutes. <laughs> okay. um, but there is a process, and, and Talia has highlighted some of this very shortly. You know, the strategic adaptive management space allows these two, two elements actually to get together. And when I do this and I follow that strategic adaptive cycle that Sally has, Sally has highlighted so very much, I actually get some outcomes that both guys can live with. 
Scientists learn by doing, and they get the understanding that they want. Managers do by learning, and they get the impacts that they want. And I think it's some of the things that Danny has asked that is really important. And this is perhaps a, a, a bridging process that are really important for us. And just to illustrate it to you, we did a little bit of exercise like that around elephant impact. So we've got now evidence that we've understood. We said, how can we use those evidence to build an understanding and interventions? In the Kruger case, for example, we asked, where are elephants having impacts? We identified 56 odd places. We went through an exercise with the rangers and with a whole bunch of people, and we identified the mechanisms of how this happened. Go right from water availability, particular trees, interactions with fires, seasonal flooding. Really interesting is that a very large fraction of those little spots that you're seeing out here where elephants are having consequences happen to overlap with where people used to live. And they used to have three kinds of activities. They would hunt, uh, they would have subsistence cultivation, and there was some local mining. So these sort of things, I think, are, are really important um, in illustrating We've gone through several bridges. We've got this TFCA. We've got elephants walking across the landscape. The impact of implementation is on a local scale. And on a local scale, I have to sit down with local people, co-designing what is going wrong and how will I affect that particular uh, mechanism that is going wrong. So I'll leave you with this, this message. I think we can improve our learning. Um, and we can trust in science, but most importantly, we need to trust each other. Uh, and if we do that, we can find some very novel solutions and a very fast-changing world, which I think was very evident. So thank you very much. Sorry, Samantha. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Sam. I think you have done what most elephants do well, which is uh, cause some trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we've got no time for questions. Um, then we'll just move uh, right along. Uh, while uh, Susanna gets kitted, I hope I got her name right, um, I'll just introduce her topic. So she'll be talking about sustainable human megafauna coexistence potential in savanna landscapes. So we'll just wait for her to get up to the stage and then she can take over. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Susanne Vogel. And uh, today I would like to share some of the work um, that we've done with a, quite a large transdisciplinary team. Um, you can see all the names uh, on the slide. And it's a team of international scientists and also conservation practitioners. And together we try to think about um, sustainable human uh, coexistence potential, but after Sam's talk, I should have maybe called it um, not sustainable, but thrivable, because I think our definition uh, seems to um, relate to how he explained it. Um, yeah, so the beginning is going to be quite theoretical. Please bear with me. If you stay around, I'll promise to show you some cool elephant pictures later, so we'll see. Um, most of you probably know this term, human wildlife conflict. We've heard it a few times already. And uh, basically, one of the issues that I think sh is around this topic is that it's not always clear what people mean with it. And also, within a paper, sometimes you see people switching between definitions. Another issue is that often it's not necessarily conflicts between humans and wildlife, but between people around wildlife. And that's, I think, something we've seen a lot today. Another sort of emerging ter term that comes about is human-wildlife coexistence. And I think lots of research is trying to move to both, and you also see the IUCN human-wildlife conflict and coexistence uh, special task uh, recently emerging. And again, this is a concept not really clearly defined. Today, I will use the definition, uh, basically humans and wildlife sharing space and resources. And with that also, human-wildlife coexistence potentials starts to be studied. Uh, one of the issues I have with this, how it's currently being studied, is that often we basically uh, look at density potential of a species, and we see which are the social ecological conditions that a species needs to thrive in an area. And you see I've marked this line, the occurrence potential. Basically, there are some social ecological conditions below which a species is not able to survive, like an elephant in the middle of a multi a multi-million city or a desert, for example, although for elephants that's maybe not the case, but 
Um, and above it, you can see an increase in density potential, so the amount of elephants or other species that could occur. However, if you are looking at coexistence, especially sustainable or thrivable coexistence, I think it's also important to realize coexistence needs both parties to agree, right? And I think that's something what Sam also just highlighted. So in a way, this is, could be seen as the wildlife perspective or the perspective of humans that wildlife need. But we need to add this extra access a human perspective. So are w people actually willing to coexist? And this uh, threshold I just showed you also exists for on this human axis, because there's, you can see this axis going from active negative to passive to active positive. And an active negative uh, human perspective actually means that you want, you, you, you want to reduce the coexistence. So, so you want, for example, to reduce the species. If people want elephants to be gone on a, of an area on the long run, so in the sustainable run, you won't actually find them um, being able to, because they'll want to remove the elephants. So for active negative, but also for passive, passive basically being um, unaffected, so not caring at all, we see that there's still a lack of active coexistence support, so people are not happy to live with the species. So we think, as you can see, this is like how human wildlife coexistence, but we think the sustainable or tribable human wildlife coexistence, it needs people to actually actively want to live with the species, so be co uh, have this active coexistence support. And we measure this by focusing on willingness to coexist. So just to recap, um, for a social, a sort of sustainable coexistence potential, you need these an animal and these uh, human coexistence thresholds to be met. Um, you need sufficient social ecological conditions for wildlife, but you also need people to express that they want to live with this wildlife. And then if you use this framework, you could have um, see for certain areas where on these axis they lie, and on which of the categories or which of the um, topics you need to focus if you want to improve this coexistence potential. And it is both on topic, but also if you um, use a spatial way of measuring both of these axes, you could also within the region see what's the coexistence potential and how is it distributed. So this is what we wanted to try. And as I said, with lots of people from both ecological, diehard ecologists and also social scientists, and I don't know if you ever tried to do something like this, but it's pretty hard, especially because some of the ecologists, they, they didn't really completely trust it, um, for example, qualitative data analysis. Thank you. So we wanted to know if people want to live with elephants, and the issue with that question is that people might answer yes, they might answer no, but while they might answer yes, they might be thinking, Yes, or no, but I worry the interviewer might disagree, or I think other people think the right answer is yes, or other reasons why they say something different than what they actually mean. So I think we notice this is biases in um, data that we collect that's based on re um, yeah, relying on the responses of people. Uh, but we wanted to try and account for this and do so in a way that will be accepted by ecologists. But the nice thing is it's something that actually occurs in ecology as well. Because if you think about it, in a way, what you have is false positive and false negative reporting error. And Divya Fasudev and Varun Goswami, two of our co-authors from India, already developed uh, an idea where they use Bayesian hierarchical approaches, basically hierarchical ecological occupancy modeling, to account for these. Just to recap, what is it? Uh, hierarchical uh, occupancy modeling, basically what you do is you include different methods. Um, if you think about birds, you could use sound and visuals. And for one of the methods, you know there is a very low risk of either false or a positive or false negative reporting error. For the other method, you're not so sure about it, but it doesn't necessarily matter, because what you're going to do is you're going to use the certain method to correct or to mitigate the issues in the uncertain method. What you end up with is basically a probability of a presence of a species. Now, we try to do this in the same way, but when Likert uh, questions. So we have these statements, and we ask people to respond to them. And some of these statements from the cultural uh, context and from our experience in the field. So some of the uh, co-authors are also Maasai, because I will speak about the Maasai Mara in a bit. Um, it's very unlikely they'll have a false positive or false negative reporting error. And then we end up, instead of probability of presence of a species, with the probability of a positive attitude towards living with elephants, and actually living, sharing space and resources 
uh, with elephants. So this is quite a long side -off. So we call this the willingness to coexist. Just to see, OK, uh, what is the muscle and marrow? I said I will speak about it now. Well, here we've got Kruger. And let's compare it to the muscle and marrow. As you can see, it's quite a bit smaller. Um, Kruger is, of course, next to it is the APNR. And you've got the Limpopo, which we just heard about. Uh, muscle and marrow is a national reserve, just like Kruger, also state-owned. But uh, instead of Kruger, it's quite a, we're known to have a hard boundary. So next to it, immediately, you could have people living. And it's all fenced in. The uh, Maro National Game Reserve is not always fenced in. And it has a direct uh, access from the conservancies. So this is like a buffer zone where communities, uh, Maasai, have, are owning the land. So communities originally have been given the land. Some of the regions, they've actually privatized. So individuals own land. But in these, uh, in these boundary areas, so the conservancies, they have decided to collectively engage with conservation. So they lease land for tourism and, in a way, conservation. And of course, it's also uh, there's the border with Tanzania, and you've got the Serengeti National Park, which you might know. It's quite important for the wildebeest migration. Here's the, the elephant I bribed you with. So the case study I'll just discuss with you is the Masamara in Kenya. Um, we've got the wildlife perspective I talked about and the human perspective. I'll first zoom in on this. So we did this uh, large survey. Uh, we asked across the conservancies, you can see it here. We asked these uh, 557 sorry, <laughs> uh, people, uh, Maasai ma mainly, um, how they felt about living with elephants. So we did our, we collected our model data, but also we asked a lot of in-depth questions. And then we repeated it after the first year of COVID. So actually, as you can see, <laughs> I had to be removed from the area during COVID, so it was a bit stressful. Um, but I didn't do it uh, myself, but we had this big team of 10 interviewers, and together we also made sure that we add the cultural, um, contest, sorry, cultural context to those uh, statements that we were certain that could most likely only have false positive or false negative uh, reporting error. We used 16 of these statements. Some were on general attitudes, so how do people feel about elephants? And some were these very local experience attitudes. Um, from this, we already published it. So this week, it came out in Biological Conservation. So please read it if you were interested. But I'll just highlight a few of our results. So the first thing, I think, is very similar as what Sam mentioned. Well, you need to experience a coexistence or living with a species Thank you. if you want to have an opinion. And you see here elephants. There's lots of variance in how people felt about living with them. Here you see in blue the general attitude, and the green the types of willingness to coexist. Rhino are very uncommon in the area. You can see people actually, their general attitude is not so different from their willingness to coexist, and nothing really affected. So it didn't matter their education or their experiences, whether or not they wanted to live with it. Also, we mapped the distribution of these uh, willingness to coexist. The darker, the more likely people wanted to live with elephants and also the kind of threat they reported. So you see across the region, the threats were really differently divided. But the most important threat was experiencing elephants as a threat to human lives. And you can see this by, it's quite a strong negative effect because it's very far removed from the zero line. So what it means that actually we think people are less positive to live with elephants if they consider elephants to be a threat to their human lives. From the animal side, I'll be quite brief here. So we had over 10 years uh, of uh, aerial survey data from the Kenyan Wildlife Service. We mapped out where the elephants went. Then we actually first did a large systematic review on which factors are most important driving uh, elephant habitat suitability. We did some DAX, we did uh, correlation analysis, and ended up with spatial layers for water, precipitation, uh, elevation, uh, terrain, NDVI, cattle, uh, distributions and settlements. So we use different model techniques to map out the habitat, socio-ecological habitat suitability. And we did that because we wanted to see, OK, does it really depend on which method you use to um, apply our theoretical framework? And actually, it turned out it didn't really matter because, well, of course, there's some differences between the different uh, frameworks. If we try to use our um, conservation prioritization zones, uh, approach to map out sustainable coexistence potential, there's the same kind of tendencies. So in light green is low, dark blue is high, 
um, medium green. <laughs> it's like low willingness to coexist, but high socio-ecological suitability. And light blue, it's low socio-ecological uh, suitability, but high willingness to coexist. And then we repeated it after COVID, and actually, we were very worried with COVID that it would reduce people's willingness, because as you can see, it's all depending on this willingness to be leasing and income from tourism, but actually, COVID increased <laughs> people's um, willingness to uh, live with elephants after a year of no tourism. And w one thing that's really important is that we also did these in-depth uh, qualitative interviews. So when I recap our results, uh, first of all, just a recap of this sustainable coexistence potential. The thresholds need to be met. There should be sufficient conditions and people need to be willing. But also, we need this multi-model approach that equ uh, equally integrates both the ecological and social perspectives. And there's this potential in applying ecological model concepts, but we also need to have this both quantitative but also qualitative research, because without the qualitative interviews, we would not have understood our results. Again, let's compare the Masamar. Oh, I'll just skip this for a bit. But of course, the hard boundary is also relative in Kruger, and conflict is more than just cooperating. But there's a study I want to highlight by Rhys Thornley that we actually f found out that if you look continent-wide in Africa, that um, the biomass of large herbivores is also most strongly interviewed by Human Development Index. So basically, uh, education, uh, lifespan, and uh, so education, healthcare, <laughs> and lifespan, and so a GP, sorry. So it's actually really important how people are doing that are living around the P, uh, uh, private area, um, and not just only for those areas where people are living uh, in the conservancy and they own the land, but also living around the PA. But I really recommend this uh, preprint, and tomorrow at 8.15 he's also giving a talk. So I just want to end with a quote from one of the Maasai, where they actually highlight this, there should be uh, adequate protection for both people and wildlife, because of course I'm not saying if people are unwilling to live somewhere, uh, sorry, unwilling to coexist with wildlife, we should remove the wildlife. We're trying to say, okay, if they are unwilling, that means that we have a role to play and we need to step up and make them, um, yeah, we in a way make them want to be willing and figure out how we can improve their happiness with living with these animals, because if they don't want to, especially in areas like the Mara, there's no future for these animals. Um, again, it's already published. Please come and speak with me uh, if you want to know more about the results or more. Uh, also, if you have discussions, different opinions, I'm really keen to that. So, yeah, let me know. And another elephant to bribe you, so thank you. Um, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, unfortunately, again, no time for questions. I think the speakers in these sessions are just avoiding questions, so maybe they have quite a lot to share, uh, but then we, we're going to move right along to sticking with the elephants again, and I'm hoping that uh, Victoria will at least buy us some time so that we can start having questions uh, for the speakers. Uh, but then Victoria will be taking us um, uh, through her talk where she's talking about conservation corridors to reduce human wildlife conflicts and to advance uh, conservation efforts in Southern Africa. Uh, Victoria, whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So before I start, I just want to um, say that just like the Sun Park Week gave people the privilege to get to see elephant and some other animal for the first time, the, science, uh, the Savannah Science Network meeting has also given me the privilege to see some of these animals for the first time. I'm working on elephants and yeah, I enjoy I was so fascinated seeing elephants just this, during this meeting. It's a great one. Um, my name is Victoria Okeowo, and I'm a master's student at Stellenbosch University. I'm being supervised by Dr. Sandra McFadden and Professor Kangui, with an external collaborator, Dr. Katerina. And I belong to the same research group with uh, Wesley Douglas, who spoke yesterday on invasive species in Kruger, and some other research team members will be speaking also on rhino and some other adaptive mechanism today. We are a team of mathematicians and ecologists, yeah. So, talking about designing conservation corridor to reduce human wildlife conflict and advance conservation effort for elephants in Southern Africa, 
To begin with, I'm going to talk on human wildlife conflicts, but yeah, so many talks have been around that, and this session has been quite interesting for me. So human wildlife conflict, like we know, is when we begin to have negative impact from the needs of um, animals, of wildlife, and the goals of human. We want to expand, we want to, for those in the local communities, they want to do their farming, they want to feed their family and some other things. And elephant and wildlife in general also love to roam, they love to move around. So when these two things are beginning to affect each other negatively, we can say we have human-wildlife conflict. And yes, there have been different uh, mitigation strategy to, to, um, to put these things in place. One of those things that have been put in place is the um, use of protect, protected areas. However, they are becoming insufficient as the population of elephants in some places are increasing, not declining anymore. They are increasing, and so there is need for TFCA, for Transfrontier Conservation Area, just like Alex mentioned in his opening talk today. There is need for TFCA, and yeah, Conservation Corridor, uh, natural landscape that connects patches and fragments of land to enable wildlife roam free, freely. Now, the studies on the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area, the Kaza TFC, and I'm focusing on the Namibia component of this. The Kavango Zambezi TFCA is initiative of five South African countries, that's Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The government of these five nations, we've been talking around policy, science, and all of those. So the government of these five nations came together and agreed to um, this initiative. Because the, more than half of the population of elephants in Africa actually is in southern Africa. And I think it's a good way to conserve wildlife. So we got data on elephants in the Namibia component of Kaza, elephant data of three individuals, three elephants, two bulls, and one cow from 2007 to 2008. A total of 4,143 locations were recorded, and these are the distribution for the meals that we got. Uh, this is the Kaza TFCA, and we can see the location of these elephants in the landscape. Yes, the blue one is the female elephant there, and then the male elephant is the green one and the red one, all moving in the landscape in the Kaza TFCA, the Namibia component of it. So as a uh, mathematical ecologist, we used um, the step selection function. Oh, sorry before that. Um, we also got environmental data of this landscape, the water density there, the NDVI, which is the normalized difference vegetation index, which tells us about the vegetation greenness in the landscape, and then the human modification and the human modification index which also talk about the human density in this landscape. As we are talking about human-wildlife conflict, we don't leave out the human factor there. And because um, of the elephant, uh, the wildlife, or rather the animal in, we are talking about, we also consider the behavior, and that's why we have, that's why we have the um, greenness index and then the water. So with this set of data that we have, we proceed to implement the step selection function, which is, a, which is a type of model that is used to gain insight into elephant, move into animal movement, so that we can understand their pattern. Understanding the pattern of elephant movement will enable us to be able to, to, to predict where the corridors can be put. So to use the step selection function, we start by loading the elephant data that we have, 
we define the U step. The U step are the actual location of this elephant, and then the available ones are other random steps. That is, if an elephant is in a position, what are the other places he could have gone to? Those are the available steps. Then we extract the environmental variables in this location and match them together with the elephant data that we have. After this has been done, we go ahead to do some statistical analysis using the conditional logistic regression. And then from there, we can make ecological inferences because we have put into consideration the behavior of the animal and some other factors. Um, so just like I mentioned already that we used um, we have the used step, which are the actual location of the elephant, and then the available steps, which are the random ones that we took in the same landscape so that we can understand why the elephant is in a particular location. These are the actual steps of the elephant, and then the generated random steps. We generated five available steps for each of the used steps. Okay, and from the analysis, we come up with this preliminary result, which for NDVI, the normalized difference vegetation index representing the greenness of the landscape. We can see that it is positive, and this implies that this elephant will likely move towards green vegetation. Most of their time is spent in foraging, and for human, predictor also, we can see that it is also positive. This does not mean that the elephant is going towards a child in the farm, no. The elephant is attracted to the crop, it is attracted to what they have, in, and so they tend to move to those directions. This is a potential for human-wildlife conflict. That means there is potential for conflict to occur, because if, this, if the elephants go raiding the farmland of the community, there are tendencies that there will be a revenge on this elephant. And then for the water density, considering our landscape, we have negative here. This does not mean they don't drink water, but they only move towards water when they have to drink the water. So from this analysis, we can say that green, the greenness of the vegetation and then the human modification in this are more attractors for elephant. Now, it doesn't end there. This is just to help us know what attracts elephants and where potential, where, uh, yeah. This is to help us have an insight into places of conservation significance and also places that will be human wildlife conflict hotspots. And this will be used to inform policy makers and stakeholders so that the necessary steps and actions can be taken. But, this is a first step in the whole thing. This step selection function will then be fitted into an agent-based model, which will help to predict the corridors and also the areas of human wildlife hotspots. Now, we also look forward to checking the impact of different days, time of the day on elephant movement. How do they move? How do they move during the day? How do they move at night also? So we believe that coexistence is possible, just like the friend speaker have mentioned, but then this is not limited to science. The social part of it must be integrated also. I will leave us with this, that it is possible for animals and for wildlife and nature to coexist, we believe I'm so sorry. Can you help me, please? Okay, thank you. So we believe and we dream of a future where man and nature will exist in harmony. And to say thank you to my collaborators, to my funders, the DAD, and also to everyone who is seated here who have listened to this presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Victoria, and um, I see you positively responded to the call of questions. 
So we've got a corridor for two questions. Okay. Um, any questions from the floor? No, guys, not after I've asked so much for question time. <laughs> questions? Going? Okay. okay. Denny, thank you. Thanks, Victoria. You, you sort of, I suppose, alluded to it at the end. Um, how is temporal separation between humans and wildlife factored in? So, you know, they might be moving towards people, but they might be doing it at night where the danger is low. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, that we are going to consider the impact of different time of the day. We are yet to do that study. So we'll be considering the elephant move towards human during the day or at night. So I look forward to um, another Savannah Network meeting to update us with the result of this study. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Uh, we'll move right along. Um, Bob is ready here, and then um, he will also take the stage, and then he will talk to us about understanding space use by African elephants uh, to inform spatial conservation priorities. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Bob Mandinyanya. I'm going to uh, share with you some of, uh, some of the results from an ongoing project on understanding space use by African elephants in the landscapes around Gonarejo National Park in Zimbabwe. <coughs> so this, this, uh, this work is on the background that uh, land has become a limited resource which is supposed to fulfill multiple functions and in, in some cases, it then results in conflict between wildlife and human. As such, wildlife has also become constrained in protected areas, and in some cases, it makes them geographically isolated. Gwenarejo National Park is also part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area, um, and one of the goals of the GOTFCA is to facilitate the dispersal of wildlife populations between protected areas where possible. Uh, and then in this study, what we're trying to do is trying to understand how these elephants are utilizing the landscapes outside the Gonarajo National Park using data from 26 elephants um, that had GPS collars between 2016 and 2022. So we're trying to understand how they are dispersing themselves outside the park, and the park itself is actually surrounded by communities and private properties, both in Zimbabwe and in Mozambique. And what we found out that is that um, most of the dispersal is actually dominated by bull elephants, which are the ones you see here in, in this bluish color. And here already, this bull would have uh, gone all the way into Kruger National Park. And this one is way into Mozambique towards Banin National Park. What we've also found out is that uh, when they're outside the park, females tend to remain within an 18 kilometer radius of the park boundary, wireless males range even further to distances of about 60 kilometers, in which case they can end up in either Kruger and sometimes uh, fairly close to Banin National Park. They've gone within a 30 kilometer um, distance towards uh, Banin National Park. Something that we've also learned is that when they're outside the park, these elephants are mostly utilizing or prefer to use uh, open forest with deciduous leaf uh, woodlands with mixed and shrub grasslands as well. But uh, also both males and females tend to use also croplands uh, when they do go outside the park. But something that we really need to work on is to really understand, to get finer details of these land use and land cover types to understand the, uh, the species dynamics or um, the vegetation species that are within the land use and land cover types that they will be using. When they're outside the park, females tend to not come close to homesteads, while these males tend to not mind that. But something that we've also realized is that uh, during, it's only during the hot dry season when males are the only ones that tend to like to be close to homesteads, not sure what they will be favoring. Because it's only during the hot, wet, and cool dry season when there is potential um, access to 
crops for these elephants. So as I conclude, I'd just like to leave you to, to know that uh, we found out that these elephants actually have high fidelity to the park, spending over spending about 84.5% of their time within the protected area. And uh, when they also tend to spend uh, most of their time outside the park during the hot dry season. And we've also learned that um, they are most likely to move to areas like Kruger National Park uh, during the early hot, early hot wet season, just before the rains, before the Limpopo River floods. And uh, yeah, like I said in the beginning, we are dis I'm discussing these results in the context of an ongoing work on trying to understand how these elephants are using these landscapes outside the park to find out which areas could be prioritized for conservation besides the existing protected areas. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Bob. Um, Unfortunately, again, no time for questions. <laughs> um, but then we're going to move and move over to our last talk on elephants before we move to other species. Uh, then Mika will take us through some of the work they've been doing uh, in Kenya. All right. Hello, everybody, and good morning, or soon we are going to lunch, so anyway. So I come from University of Helsinki, Finland, and uh, first of all, I would ask myself what the heck I do here. And heck is, of course, the human-elephant conflict. Anyway, so I believe I have some, something to kind of contribute, especially is here master students. Please raise your hands. Not so many. Anyway, somebody who will learn something about human elephant conflict and GIS. That's why I'm here. Okay, let's continue. First of all, when you do your human elephant conflict uh, studies, please make nice maps. So that's why I show the first map here. So our study area is in Kenya. I've been involved in all type of studies in Kenya since 2006, I think I went there first time. Uh, mostly about land use, land cover modeling, and that's why I said, what, what heck are you doing here? But we have done also uh, wildlife com conflict studies uh, some with the elephants, which I've been now presenting you. So Tavata country, it's situated in southern Kenya. And it's kind of, can you take myself away from there, thanks. Okay, so Tavata country, it's situated in uh, southern Kenya, and it's quite interesting area in that sense that it actually most of the whole county is kind of conservation areas. It kind of, there is Chavo West, Chavo East parks. And then there are a little bit uh, smaller ones, uh, conservation areas. And of course, it hosts a lot of elephants, 33% of Kenyan elephants. Oh, there, take myself away from there, thanks. Okay, so because of that, it's dis uh, designated as a human wildlife conflict hotspot. Okay, so we examined human elephant conflict incidence data over a 15 years period from 2004 to 2018, and we identified various types of human elephant conflicts, and then we did some spatial temporal analysis methods. Okay, so study questions, those basic ones. What is the nature of human elephant conflict in Taita Taveta County? What are the temporal patterns and what are the spatial patterns? Me as a geographer, I'm going to kind of concentrate to the spatial patterns because you are kind of expert in maybe temporal patterns. So let me concentrate to the spatial 
patents. Uh, something about the data. So the data, as I saw uh, two earlier studies, you have very nice data. You have all kind of color data, very detailed data. Uh, so what we actually had data, we only had this kind of incidence, in, incident data of uh, over a 15-year period reported by Community Wildlife Service. And it's part of uh, Kenya Wildlife uh, Service. And we are analyzed a few uh, variables, date of conflicts, which sub-county and whether incident occurred and, and like that. Okay, then comes the question because uh, this is the data set. Anybody here from KWS? Hopefully not because this is real data. I did some modifying it so if you now copy it or take po photograph, it's crap. All right. So spatial data, now comes to get question with spatial data. Please, I want to, anybody, where is the spatial data now? Answer me. Master students, please, okay, there is one. Where is spatial data? Tell me, I tell you here. Okay, so special data for this study were exactly here. So once you have special data like that, you don't have any coordinates, you don't have any, any fancy things which I saw, just saw. You know, you have color and you have every 10 minutes or something where elephant were. We didn't have nothing. Okay, how to do special data? It's something like this. You need some uh, data management, data, uh, data this and data that. Okay, so what we did, we identified from those names, villages, uh, ranches, whatever, we identified 107 uh, points, and then we used whatever you can use with, uh, you can use Google Maps, you can use topographical maps, there's geonames, there is open, uh, open source maps, and of course, you, if you talk to locals, they won't know. Okay, with, then we had a few other spatial data, and okay, this, this was pretty much something related to uh, doing some GIS. So from here, you then make some rasters or whatever. You get distance-based uh, layers, and then you can analyze with those ones. Okay, so there was, of course, some descriptive statistic involved in this study. I go them very quickly. I'm much more interested in the spatial things. Okay, so we analyzed uh, something like, okay, I'll go back. About the statistical methods, some kind of yearly, monthly, seasonal patterns. So those we studied. Some frequency distribution, so on. But I'm more interested in the spatial patterns and, and like that, so we did some graduated simple maps, visualization like elephant inju uh, injury, crop rating, property damage, human injury, and so on, so on. And did some other stuff well. Okay, so some results. Elephant threats. Most of the, most of the kind of, uh, I think, how many percent? 60, more than 60 percent was uh, elephant threats, crop rating, property damage, and, and human injury, and so on. And elephant in, injury, uh, you know, I'm wondering why only so little, maybe locals don't bother to kind of report those things. Okay, so some, some about more about results. During the study period, there was moderate increase in heck, and Elephant threat and property damage, they also increased. And crop rating, and most of the incident happened like 16, uh, 2016 and 18. All right. Okay, and the property damage kind of they peaked. Uh, uh, there was throughout the year, there was some kind of property damage, but crop 
braiding, of course, peaked after the long rains and, and during the harvesting. Okay, then comes the more interesting part for me because now we can kind of actually do some spatial patterns from that Excel, which I showed. After doing some GIS magic, you can actually map, map these things. Okay, so there is elephant thread in the area, and most of the elephant thread actually follows the main elephant mig migratory roads. And pretty much crop rating, same thing, and areas where, they, where there is property damage, it's a little bit more spread. And what else we have? Okay, human injury, they were also wide, widely, more widely spread. And then we come to human death. And as you can see, they are happening close by the villages. But still, I think they are following in this kind of migratory routes. And elephant injury, and this map is, in my mind, quite funny. Why, why they don't report if had elephant injury? There is like, we have data from 2004 to 2018, and there is few, only few kind of reports. Okay, and livestock dead, dead, dead locals report th them, of course, and like that. And maybe elephant dead, and I was wondering why it's so few, but still. Okay, there is, this is just the last map showing that, okay, there would be many different types of this was only few kind of special special uh, ways to model this kind of uh, Excel-based data which actually has only the names of villages and from there you can actually do some special mapping. And conclusions for, for our study was that despite mitigation measures, there has been moderate increase in HEC in, in this DTC which is started at Tavata County. And uh, there is elephant threat and crop damage are the main kind of types. And surprising proximity to Chavo National Park, it was not associated with increased human elephant conflict. Quite surprising results. And like that. So but anyway, this type of maps I think would be much more better for the for the local governmental policy makers to actually understand what's going on here. If you saw this kind of uh, maybe Excel or if you make a pivot table even from the Excel, I don't know, they don't understand, but maps should be more easy to understand. Okay, it's based for, there's one study we, we had actually, uh, master's program, I was kind of leading it in Taita Taveta County, they, we created a master program in geoinformatics and Marta Munyao, she was first uh, master, uh, doing master thesis and now he's actually doing a PhD at, at uh, University of Helsinki. And this was her first paper. Okay, and some acknowledgement and thanks. If you copy that link there now, so you can actually get that paper. And it's free, freely available from, where was it published? Global Ecology and Conservation. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mika. Yeah. Uh, please don't walk away. Okay, questions. I, I want to appeal to my master's students mm, good. to ask him Questions. We've got time for at least two questions. Ask me. Master students from the floor, two questions. Okay.
I don't hear anything. Please okay. put the mic yeah, on. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, just a point of clarity. You did mention the, uh, sorry, I'm a diploma student, by the way, but um, you did mention that there is um, crop raiding and um, property damage as one of the biggest problems. But you also mentioned elephant threat. What is elephant threat? Can you explain what that means? I don't hear you. Yeah. So he's might, just, he's yeah. just uh, in terms of the categories that you used, mm -hmm. you had a category for elephant yeah. threat. Okay. So how do you define that? Uh, how we defined it, it was in the data. You know, I just got the data, data set. I didn't define it in any way. It came from Kenya, Kenya Wildlife Service. So it was ready, ready done data, and from there we kind of did, did whatever there was available. Did I answer your question? I think your diploma student is happy. Yeah. So we can let okay. you go. Thank you very Actually, much. Actually, yeah, I still have something. You know, we were in the morning, we were in morning walk. And rangers actually <laughs> ask very tough questions to us. And one was okay because uh, about elephant conflict and conservation, about the fences. Should we fence or should we not fence? And he challenged me, and I think in the end he was thinking that we should fence so we can save the elephants. Thanks, my last word. Thank you once again. Okay, so while we get uh, Lucretia uh, kitted to take up the stage, I'll just introduce her topic, and she'll be talking about range scale patterns in human lion dynamics as a starting point for coexistence. So we'll just give her a few seconds to walk up, and then she can start when she's ready. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Luca Garcia Aguilar. Um, I am a PhD candidate um, with Andrew Davies um, at Harvard. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about some preliminary findings from the first chapter of my dissertation, um, which is looking at patterns in human lion dynamics across their range in Africa um, to give us some insights into how we might better um, promote coexistence. So human wildlife dynamics um, is one of those uh, terms that gets thrown around a little bit. Um, we've heard quite a few today about uh, like human wildlife conflict, coexistence, interactions. Um, and so the way that I'm defining uh, human wildlife dynamics is direct or indirect interactions between uh, humans and wildlife across various scales. And so these interactions can be negative, such as livestock depredation um, or the killing of wildlife, um, but they can also be neutral or positive. So for example, in this um, map, um, we're seeing uh, examples of where wildlife actually reduces disease risk for people. So human carnivore dynamics in particular can be very conflict prone. Um, and this is due to three main uh, overarching factors. The first is that there's quite a bit of resource competition between people and uh, large carnivores, um, in particular over space and diet. The second is that um, humans as super predators exert quite uh, intensive pressures on apex carnivores of the next trophic level down. Um, and the third is that carnivore species really elicit strong emotional uh, responses in people, um, such as like fear and fascination, um, and this can lead to really emotionally charged interactions. All of this um, can lead to conflicts such as livestock depredation, um, human injury or death, and the killing of uh, carnivore species. 
Negative human carnivore dynamics have some really severe consequences, um, ecologically, socioculturally, and just intrinsically. Um, as carnivore uh, species decline um, due to conflict, we see trophic cascades that can affect species at all levels um, and even affect uh, landscape morphology. Um, we also see effects on human well-being, both in terms of uh, physical health um, and mental health, but also in terms of uh, cultural, uh, cultural traditions and icons. Um, and then there's the obvious economic losses from something like livestock depredation, where you're losing uh, property. Um, but there's also things like just decreased biological and cultural diversity and actually the worsening of other human wildlife uh, conflicts, such as um, when you lose a, an apex predator, you then have mesopredator release, which can lead to higher rates of conflict um, between people and those mesopredators. So lions, as we all know, are a very charismatic species. Um, they are a biological and a cultural keystone species, um, and they also serve as a flagship species for a lot of conservation initiatives, um, bringing in a lot of interest and, and resources into conservation. But for a lot of agropastoralists who live uh, in landscapes where lions roam, Lions can also be really a pest species um, that's taking um, very important uh, livestock and causing a lot of conflict. Lions, um, in, due to anthropogenic threats um, and uh, in particular human lion conflict, lions have decreased substantially over the past century. Um, about, uh, lions have seen about a 90% decline in population numbers and about a 95% decline um, in, in range. Um, and um, like I said, the human lion conflict is one of the main reasons for this decline. Um, and human lion conflict has been predicted to be worse um, in East Africa and along uh, protected area boundaries based off lion population, uh, human population, and livestock uh, numbers. But there hasn't actually been um, uh, analysis with uh, actual conflict incidence data done at a range scale. Most human lion dynamic studies have focused on the local scale, and this is really important because, um, as we've heard today, uh, human wildlife dynamics are very context dependent and very complicated. Um, and so local knowledge, um, and especially the local knowledge held by local communities, um, is essential for dealing with conflict. However, we have a lot of limitations um, at the local scale, in particular with um, resource deficiencies and situational constraints. So for example, from this graph, you can see that um, areas that have large protected areas with lions um, often have uh, uh, large deficiencies also in the funding available to them. And this is where global or regional frameworks can really come in handy because we can use them as a starting point for um, mitigating conflict and promoting coexistence in places where um, resources haven't been available to do these local scale um, uh, studies. Um, and it, they can also help facilitate collaboration across, um, across locations to deal with this, with this issue. So to fill this gap in uh, range-wide understanding, we're asking the question of what drives human lion interactions um, toward conflict or coexistence across all of Africa. Um, and we've split this into four main sub-questions. The first is to look at how conflict and coexistence are actually defined in the literature, um, and also whether field collective uh, quant field collected quantitative data on human lion interactions is even available and if it is standardized. We also want to see what the distribution of reported conflict is across Africa and um, what specific socioecological factors are driving um, uh, conflict and interactions the most. So to do this, we're doing a um, systematic uh, literature review and meta-analysis. Um, and we've started by using Web of Science to do uh, a standardized search. 
um, and then removing the duplicates from that literature set. Um, and then doing an initial screening where we remove anything that is an obvious exclusion. So like we've gotten quite a few um, papers that are on mountain lions or lionfish um, or sea lions. And so those have to get taken out, um, which is why we go from 752 to 251 records. We're then using the um, standardized uh, PRISMA process to go through um, and uh, do eligibility assessments for the remaining 251 um, included literature set. Um, and this requires us to use very specific rules and explain why um, uh, different records are included or excluded. So we're using four specific rules. Mainly, we're excluding if literature does not have quantitative data on human-lion conflict or interactions. Um, if there's no clear description of the spatial area or the time period covered, um, and then also if it's a review article that is um, covering data that, has, that is in other records in our literature set. And so far, we've made it through um, 65 of these uh, full-length articles, um, and we're seeing an exclusion rate of about 58%. So in looking at the included um, literature set thus far, we're seeing that um, less than a quarter of the included records are actually clearly defining conflict, and almost no records have any uh, coexistence definitions at all. Um, and so it's been very difficult um, to, uh, it's very difficult to quantify something that you don't have a definition for. Um, and I want to draw your attention to three inconsistencies that um, we're really noticing over and over again. The first is whether or not um, wildlife uh, perspectives are included in the definition of conflict. Um, so you can see sometimes conflict is defined as just livestock or uh, human injury or death, and sometimes harm to wildlife um, is also included. The other um, thing that we're noticing is, is a mixing of the terms of threat and conflict. Um, and threat and conflict are sort of being used um, occasionally for the same things. Um, but uh, we need to look into a bit more if those actually are the same. Um, and then finally, um, there it has been more and more of a use of coexistence um, in the literature. Um, but there's a mixture of whether coexistence means actually more positives, like benefits to people and wildlife, or if it just means sufficient negatives to get below a certain threshold, or sufficient uh, reduction of negatives to get below a certain threshold. So uh, in terms of the quantified conflict that we've seen, um, we've seen a large variation in the metrics used to measure uh, human line conflict. So, there's things like number of lions killed or number of people hurt. Um, and then there's also um, been things like number of interviewees who have various negative feelings toward lions. Um, and then in terms of uh, methods used to collect those, uh, those metrics, we're also seeing large variation. Um, in particular, um, reports from governments and NGOs, um, and then uh, interviews as well, and so that uh, differential and methods um, can make it a bit difficult to, um, to uh, extrapolate across areas. In terms of the distributions of the records um, that we have looked at, um, that map might be a little hard to see, but um, we, as expected, we are seeing a lot of records in East Africa, um, and then, but also down into um, Botswana uh, in particular. Um, and we have seen a very steady increase in um, human lion conflict and coexistence records um, over about the last 20 years, which matches um, human wildlife conflict and coexistence um, literature in general. And then our analysis of socioecological predictors of quantified human lion conflict is still very preliminary, but so far we're seeing um, uh, main predictors fall into six categories. Um, these include landscape, so things like vegetative cover or distance to water bodies, um, season, wildlife, uh, things like wild prey abundance or lion densities is an obvious one, uh, livestock, um, so the species of livestock included, um, like cattle versus shoats, um, and also the actual morphology of the livestock. 
Um, and then uh, things related to people, such as cultural practices or densities, um, and things related to conservation strategies um, and management uh, practices that are in place in those areas. So we're seeing that definitions and metrics um, for human lion conflict are often lacking and very messy. Um, and this, of course, makes quantification very difficult um, and extrapolation very difficult. So if we can standardize methodologies for measuring conflict more across um, Africa and, uh, and beyond, um, we may be able to come up with more evidence-based uh, mitigation methods um, because we would be able to actually test um, conflict pre and post uh, various mitigation uh, strategies, um, which is something that in conservation has been called for quite a bit. Um, and then it would also allow us to compare across locations better um, and uh, collaborate um, and uh, share insights that may work in various locations. Um, we're also seeing that we do need to still do a lot of work on combating the negative bias of focusing on conflict rather than interactions, dynamics, or uh, coexistence. Um, and this is something that has started in the literature, but um, it is very difficult to measure something like coexistence or interactions. And so I think that um, we need to be thinking a little bit about how we do that. Um, and I'd love to talk to anyone afterward if you have thoughts. Um, and then in terms of next steps, um, we're working on standardizing the existing data that we have collected, um, which like I mentioned is very difficult with various different metrics. Um, and also if anyone has thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Um, and then we'll be doing uh, meta-analysis modeling for the best predictors. Um, so yeah, uh, I wanna thank uh, Lauren and Sakiko who have helped a lot uh, with going through the literature and um, thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Lucretia. Yes, you can uh, can move right along. No time for questions. You can just catch her during lunch for any discussions. Then we're going to move over to our last talk for this session. Uh, we'll have Michelle. Okay, and then she will talk to us about uh, analyzing cheetah livestock conflict in the Western Kalahari to develop uh, mitigation strategies. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle, and I'm here today in two functions. I'm here also on behalf of Cheetah Conservation Botswana, where I'm currently research coordinator. And I'm also here as a PhD student from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And today we'll be presenting uh, some results on my first chapter on determining predictors of cheetah uh, livestock conflict in the Western Kalahari. And it's part of a larger uh, study on cheetah behavior outside of protected areas. But first to set the background, um, lethal removal over livestock depredation is the main cause of global carnivore decline. So therefore, there's a need for us to identify areas where this predation risk is the highest. And in this way, to use relevant predictors on conflict will allow us to implement mitigation strategies in time and space, and to characterize any patterns in conflicts. And these variables can be environmental, we know it can be correlated to prey densities and vegetation cover, but also anthropogenic in the form of uh, human population density, cattle density, and distance to roads, for example. And by integrating these variables into a spatial risk model, we can quantify which attributes are correlated to carnivore kill sites. And in this way, can, we can develop a gradient of where conflict is most likely to occur in the landscape. And as we heard during the talks uh, previously, uh, conservation approaches today are working increasingly towards developing conservation landscapes, coexistence landscapes, where the state and interactions between humans and wildlife and prey as well as livestock is dynamic but sustainable. 
And especially considering that large carnivores to date, most of them range outside of protected areas, we need to identify in order to work towards these coexistent landscapes to reduce, to reduce livestock predation. It's the first step into developing coexistent landscapes. And this is especially the case for cheetahs. Uh, cheetahs suffered a massive range contraction of nearly 90%. And here in the lighter color, you can see the historical range and the current range in the dark orange to date. And in areas with lots of lions and spotted hyenas, they are suppressing the cheetah populations. However, in areas outside of protected areas, people and humans are, people are the ones uh, suppressing cheetah populations. And as you can see here, there's a large subpopulation in Southern Africa of, of cheetah shared between Namibia and Botswana. And of this Southern African population, 70 to 80% of the cheetahs live outside of protected areas uh, where lethal removal is very common. Which brings me to my research question, which anthropogenic, environmental, and temporal variables determine when and where livestock is at risk of being predated by cheetahs? In this way, we aim to provide a scientific basis for where conflict is likely to happen in the landscape, and in this way, allow for targeted mitigation uh, strategies and implement management strategies in time and space. Uh, we did this in Ghanzi district. Uh, Ghanzi district is bordering Namibia in the east. And it's linking up the protected areas of Botswana and Namibia. It's known very well for the high livestock density. There are different types of land use in Ghanzi district. You can see protected areas. They're excluded from this study. Half of the province is made up by the Central Kalahari Game Reserve. And then in gray here, you can see commercial farmlands. Uh, this is high uh, intensively used farmland for both cattle and for game. Um, it's leased to families or groups. Uh, it's freehold farmland. And it's fenced, but it's all permeable for carnivores and uh, smaller antelopes to freely move. And then in orange, we can see pastoral land where um, people are free to let their livestock roam, uh, but it also consists of residential areas and arable land. And then we have wildlife management areas that are uh, designed to also act as a buffer zone between commercial farmlands and protected areas, but also for sustainable use of wildlife. So in this landscape, there's a very high livestock density and there's a very low human density. But it also has a very high conflict rate of cheetah. All of 35% of, of farmers uh, report conflict with cheetah on an annual basis. And as a result, cheetahs are being lethally removed on 20% of the livestock farms and game farms that they occur. In addition, there are very low densities of lion and spotted hyenas. And if we look at the ecology, um, it's made of sand felt and it's low shrub savanna. And it's also important to note that here in Ghanzi district, there are no water bodies. It's only fossil riverbeds. And there's a large network of pans, uh, undrained depressions, and they will fill up during the rainy season. And the rainy season ranges from November to March, and there's no rainfall at all during the dry season. So here you can see an example of a cattle farm. You can see there is a fence, but it's very permeable. And this is where cattle also shares the landscape with cheetahs, leading to lots of conflicts. Uh, there's been a long-term program where cheetahs have been uh, collected and then translocated into the Central Kalahari Game Reserve. But 
uh, data from GPS colors show that 80% of these cheetahs still die within a year. Uh, they do not survive in areas with high densities of lions and spotted hyenas. This is not a sustainable approach, which is why we need to go back to the first step. Like, why are they, why, when they are causing conflict, where and when is this happening as a first step into creating a coexistence landscape? So then, where do we start? Well, I started at the Department of Wildlife in Ghanti District, because they keep a registry of problem animal control reports. So when farmers experience predation with cheetahs, they can make a phone call here and it will be registered. You can see an example here of what a report looks like. Uh, someone called mentioning that they lost two calves and with the date and the name of a cattle post. Um, so what we did, these reports were all verified either by uh, Cheetah Conservation Botswana on the ground and by government officials. And we digitalized 13 years of reports, written reports and analog reports, and um, then backtracked the GPS coordinates based on the cattle post name, because this is all kept in government registries. And then we also standardized this approach, because as you can imagine, it's not uh, standardized. It depends on who is answering the phone. Then we divided all these reports into, uh, according to season, to wet and dry season. And then we used 10 environmental and anthropogenic factors as well in a um, for mapping purposes. We used vegetation type as a variable, the distance from pants and kudu density. We used kudu density as a proxy for prey density because it was derived from an aerial survey. And unfortunately, smaller antelopes, such as Steinbock and Duiker, they cannot be verified from the air. And then we use anthropogenic variables, um, so it's land use type uh, that I just explained, the distance from roads, the distance from villages, uh, cattle density per 100 square kilometers, uh, human population density, the dens distance from boreholes, and small stock density. And then we all use this in uh, Maxent software for uh, species distribution modeling, risk distribution modeling in this case. But first, we summarized um, the data here. In total, we had 249 verified reports on cheetah. And the majority of these reports were on goats, followed by cows and calves and then followed by sheep, and there were a few incidents on horses and donkeys. And we, report, we found out that the majority of these livestock uh, losses, significantly, they occurred more during the dry season. So here we uh, mapped them, and we can see first that the majority did take place on the commercial farmlands. In the wildlife management areas and pastoral lands moving south, and along the road network. So in order to build this uh, risk model, we put all the variables in Maxent. And if we look here at the permutation importance, we can see for both the dry season model as for the wet season model, that land use type was a very important factor. Followed by, for both models as well, distance from boreholes and cattle density as followed by the distance from villages. And then we also see for the dry season model that permutation importance, the distance from pants, is also relatively high. So if we look at these main variables here to look at the response curves and see the relationships, you can see that risk is increasing when cattle density is increasing. And there's a high risk close to boreholes and the further away from boreholes, the lower the risk. With the distance from villages, we can clearly see the peak here, close to villages, and after that it remains relatively uniform. And in response to roads, we can see a peak in risk of conflict close to roads, and then further away from the road network. And this resulted in the two following risk maps. Here you can see the dry season map, the wet season map, 
And in red, we can see the hotspots, the areas of high conflict. And in blue, we can see the low risk areas. And then the white blocks represent uh, areas of which there was no data available. So in summary, we can see that the highest risk was at commercial farmlands, and this is also where the highest cattle density is. And with more predation during the dry season, and with more predation close to boreholes, and with more predation uh, in the dry season at pans that are filled up with water after the rainy season, we can also say that fresh water availability will also be a main driver of conflict in this dryland ecosystem. But some variables are also correlated. For example, with the distance to villages, this is also associated with grazing zones. In the wildlife management areas, uh, cattle is restricted to uh, a 20 kilometer radius around villages for grazing, uh, which is a limitation of the study. Some variables are correlated. Another limitation is that the prey density, cattle density, uh, density of small stock is derived from aerial surveys that were done once, but of course, conflict, the conflict data is spanning a long period of time. So what kind of mitigation measures can we uh, take from here? Well, we can prioritize the commercial farmlands, and we can also ask farmers to be more cautious during the dry season, and they can do this by actively crawling their animals, but also to implement herders, because this is not something that is currently happening. All the, wild, uh, all the livestock is free roaming. These farms span uh, very large areas, up to 100 squares of kilometers. So farmers do not always actively uh, track their livestock. And another option is to implement livestock guarding dogs for small stock, especially. Cheetah Conservation Botswana has been running this program for many years and has showed an 80% reduction over seven, seven years' worth of data, an 80% reduction in livestock depredation after implementation of livestock guarding dogs. So then, how does the future look for cheetahs? Um, of course, we cannot manage the life history trades of large carnivores, but we can manage the distribution of people and their livestock. In this way, we hope to also aim to bridge the gap between theory and management and to protect cheetahs outside of protected areas in this way. Because ultimately, the survival of cheetahs depends on the people that they share the land with. And if you have any questions, please get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. And uh, unfortunately, no time for questions. But since we are moving into lunch, you can just chat with Michelle over lunch uh, for any questions or comments or inputs. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of this session. If I may just ask that we thank all the speakers that we had in this session by just a round of applause, please. Yeah, and just thanks for staying and bearing with me through this session. I hope I was not too bad. And I do welcome tips, by the way. <laughs> and um, I didn't receive any announcements, so I take that everything is still sort of running in order. Um, sorry, at the back, I'll, I'll just finish quickly if we can just settle down, please. Um, so I didn't receive any announcements, so I think everything is still running in order, although we are about... 15 or so minutes behind the normal schedule. So that means our lunch might be slightly shorter so that we are back by two o'clock. And thank you very much and enjoy lunch. <laughs>